and all my freaking drinks. I just left all my drinks in the kitchen, too. I went to fill my coffee <laughs> cup and do this, and now we're going yeah. live, and I got no damn drinks with this here. Okay, the light is green on YouTube. We're going live. And we're we starting at DEFCON 3. Wow. <laughs> yes, we're here. All right, we're going we're live. Up. This is Coco Talk, episode 70. We're on the air. We're going to do it live in right. three, two. This is Coco Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. Streaming live on YouTube and Roku, available as a podcast and enjoyed the world over. And now, here's your host. Hello, everybody. It is me. It is OG Stevie Stroh, and welcome to episode 70 of Coco Talk. The world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer, and we are with you here today. All right, somebody needs to mute whatever the hell's going on right now. <laughs> yeah, so welcome to episode 70 of Coco Talk. And uh, we've just been joined by somebody on, on uh, what the hell is it called? Uh, Periscope. Yeah, so today for Craps and Giggles, we're trying to multi-stream now. We've also added Periscope to the multiverse of live networks that we're streaming to so we're streaming live on youtube we are streaming live on roku on the coco tv channel we're streaming live on twitch and mixer and now we've also added periscope to the lineup so hello to you there carl who just joined us live on uh, periscope so today on the show who do we have we have the timberman himself from arizona rondevo how's it going everybody it's going good. We also have with us our resident Apple guy who continues to taunt us with that Apple II in the background, Mr. Mark D. Overholzer. Hello, Mark. Thank you. Glad to be here. We have creator of the Boomerang E2 board and the Paradigm uh, joystick adapter. We have Mr. Richard Lorbieski, the Angry Muppet. Hello, Richard. Hello. I just can't wait till we go live streaming on uh, MySpace. <laughs> MySpace Live, yes. There we go. In the live chat, we also have... We've had some early birds in the live chat. So the first person to pop in the live chat was Steve Powell. Then Retro Innovations. Sheldon McDonald is here. Mark Siegel is here. Ken, Ken Make It is here. Mr. James Diffin Daffer is here. Mark Overholzer in the live chat. Wayne Aaron. Tom C. from New Jersey. How you guys doing? We have Disney Saints fan join us live and... Curtis Boyle says, sorry, I can't join you guys this week or next. And we're not sorry, Curtis. That's okay. So <laughs> Curtis can't join us today. But we have in Curtis' replacement, Mr. Al Hartman from New York. How you doing, Al? From New York. New we York. Here. Said he's so nice, they named it twice. New York, New York. New York, New York. There you go. We have from Whereabouts Unknown, Mr. David Ladd. Sir David Ladd, Lord of the Floppy. How are you? Hello, everyone. How are you today? <laughs> How are we doing? Just peachy. And uh, luckily, we ha we are keeping up with our treaty of uh, the United Nations. We have at least one foreigner on the show from the Down Under. We have Mr. Nick Morentes with us. Hello, Nick. Good day. Good day, everyone. How are you? Oh, we're doing fine. We have Nick Morota in the live chat. Nick Morota. Nick Morota. Nick Morota. Nick Morota says he likes it when we mention his name. Nick Morota. How are you, Nick? All right, we're here. It's another week. And um, <laughs> Grand Lady says, I am watching this train wreck from work. All right. Grand Lady, that was... <laughs> uh, oh, uh, Ken, Ken Reichert's asking, how is Funstar coming along uh, there, Nick Marentes? Sorry? Uh, Ken Reichert is asking, how is Funstar coming along? <laughs> Fun. <laughs> you know, Nick Morota sounds like a CNN correspondent. You know? He kind of does. It means he's bringing us fake news. Um, yeah. Curtis Curtis Boyle says, "What you lack yeah. from having Curtis on the show is more than made up 
by David Ladd's enthusiasm. So <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, so that, what I was getting ready to say before Grant uh, blurted in there was I wanted to really tell you guys how great last week's show was. And I want to thank everybody for doing the show and for having a good show and, and allowing me to be able to jump off and spend some time with my family who was visiting. Um, good show. Grant did a great job. You guys all did a great job. The audience. Thank you, Grant. Thank yeah. You, Grant. And Mark Overholzer and Mikey for bringing us all that bonus content from um, uh, VCF. VCF West. Yeah, that was really cool. That was fun. Yeah, yeah was that was fun. nice. That was a surprise, unexpected surprise. Uh, Chad Cunnington just joined us. Says, greetings from Down Owner. On, uh, down under only two suburbs away from nick morenti's so just throw a boomerang over there he should be able to catch it nick so he's, <laughs> yeah. he's two suburbs away so um yeah, yeah. And that's chad hey chad welcome to the program um yeah no it was a good show i really enjoyed the fact that the show went on and um you know it was just good it was nice i actually sat down in my living room and i popped it up on uh on my, i have a 60 inch tv i'm not bragging just saying but uh watching it live on uh on youtube uh, sitting on my couch on a big screen i was like man this show looks really good and my parents were sitting in the family room at a table and the commercial for coco forever comes on on the tv and you know how um bruce's videos are so well done this was like a really perfect and my parents are like wow that's a commercial in your show and i'm like yeah this is what we do man <laughs> check this out <laughs> so it was so cool to see that just come up on a big screen you know so it's um, something when your relatives want your autograph yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> now the truth is that they hung their their heads low in shame they said oh my god what have we done <laughs> is it too late for that abortion we should have never given that computer <laughs> yeah so what's grant saying grant says thanks guys curtis and i are on strike until we get a pay increase <laughs> that should tell you something about you not being there so the, show, the, the, the attendance went up then, right? Um, yeah, that's just it. The attendance we went up. Are we at 1,100 them. now? <laughs> yes, yes. We're at, we went from 10,000 to 11,000 in one week's time. Thanks to Grant Leedy. A lot of live chat thrown by here. Uh, Curtis says, Grant, that means we may never return if he's waiting for that pay increase. <laughs> Terry Steen says, let's do this. We need a new Coco Forever episode. Yeah, where's Bruce? We need to find out from Bruce. Are all the Canadians on strike right now? We don't have any Canadians on the show today. So we'll have to oh, wait and see. Practice. Yeah. So what's new and exciting this week? Anybody done anything interesting that they want to share with us? Well, I guess I can start off. Um, I'm still working on... Uh, boomerang boards and uh i will make them available for sale on monday i want okay I, I just want to create a, a stockpile mm -hmm. uh, before i make them available for sale so i don't want to get caught by you know first day getting 30 orders and all of a sudden trying to catch up you know, right so. right well in case anybody's not familiar with what you're talking about there mr richard lorbieski let's go ahead and run the boomerang mania uh, reel here, promo reel, because boomerang, boomerang mania is sweeping the nation. So watch this. This just came in from CNN, by the way. <laughs> All right, let's try take two. <laughs> is, is, is Nick Morota there? <laughs> is Nick Morota here? Nick Morota. Nick Morota. We need Nick Morota from CNN here to have us throw yeah. this clip out here. Ha, ha, ha. 
(laughs) Boomerang Mania is real. The Boomerang E2 board. Available from Boyson Technologies. I'm excited. I just checked my mailbox. and Guess what was in it? A boomerang. Ah, Yay. Al Hartman's got his boomerang. Another, another, another customer waiting to return to Retro Innovations. No, another dissatisfied owner. <laughs> there you go. Excellent. Yeah, why well, couldn't it have had eight meg? We're yeah, working we on that. we got to raise that bar, you know, of despair here. <laughs> I assume so, the advertisement was courtesy of our Australian production unit. No, that was actually um, Rob Inman. Rob Inman did that oh. one for us. Yeah, yeah, that is yeah. that is on par with what we've been getting from Brian Joyce. That's a yeah. Brian Joyce level caliber video production there. But yeah, Rob it Inman. Was. Yeah, yeah, we've you know we've been very lucky. Um, like last week's show, we had all of you guys and everybody. The show went on, which was great. I mean, the show is bigger than any one person. Uh, The theme music, you know, we got from from Bruce Moore. We've gotten commercials from Ken Reichert, Jason's brother. We've gotten bumpers, musical jingles from Alan Huffman. You know, uh, Curtis uh, Ladd. uh, Curtis Ladd. Ladd. (laughs) Is that their love child, Curtis Ladd? (laughs) Sorry. L. Curtis Ladd. L. Curtis Boyle. L. Curtis Ladd. Yeah, the L in Curtis is for Ladd, right? So Curtis... (laughs) Curtis Ladd Boyle. So, um, yeah, Curtis has given us music. Uh, um, your son, uh, uh, Ron Delvo, we got music from your son for your yep. segment. Um, Nick Marentes has given us some segments and topics. Uh, so, yeah, this show is the melting pot that is us coconuts, which is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Curtis wants to know, does Curtis Lav have a mullet or is he bald? <laughs> Since he's the, he's got a hybrid. It's bald on top and mullet yeah. down below. <laughs> Like oh, uh, this this was great, Ron. I was I have this queued up to show. Okay. But you 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 had a picture of Curtis that you put on the cocoa and you put on like your uh, ten foot screen at your church yeah, or whatever. At church. Exactly. Yeah. So there's Curtis yeah. Boyle, and He's he didn't burst in. He didn't burst into flames. No. So and and that's good. The congregation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Retro Innovation is saying business on top and party down below. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Morota says Baron on the front and party in the back. <laughs> Curtis saw the church picture. He says bow down before me. <laughs> it is Curtis. It is the shrine of Curtis. <laughs> Never get him back on the show. Nightmare on Saskatchewan, <laughs> eh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, he had uh, mentioned that, uh, gee, how would it look uh, doing a BMP, you know, on uh, a big screen? I said, okay, I'll check it out. And I found a picture on his website there, his uh, Facebook. Yeah, yeah. He goes, oh, you could have used a different picture. Yeah, well, finding a good picture of Curtis is a challenge, so. <laughs> <laughs> he was holding a guitar. I couldn't put the guitar in, though. No, we need, you need to find one of him with the mullet and throw that one on there. <laughs> That'll, t- that'll turn a lot of people to atheists quick. <laughs> what is this? It's the uh, remake of The Omen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord. Um, let, me switch, let me switch gears here for one second. I want to show off something. I compiled something somewhere. I've got so much crap I've thrown together today, I can't find it all. All right. Here's my Microsoft Word document that I threw together this morning. Let's switch to full screen. All right, so we're going to look at some um, some numbers and some feedback. All right, so, you know, recently we celebrated 10,000 downloads on the podcast version of the show. We're now close to 10,500 in roughly, I don't know, two weeks, whatever. I don't know who's counting, right? So last week's episode, uh, episode 69, has, uh, as of this morning, was a total of 303 um, consumptions by the viewing public between... Um, between the uh, audio, video, podcast version and um, and the YouTube and stuff. So 300, I think that's our new number now. We're averaging about 300 per week, and that's a good, that's a good kind of goal to um, to look at. And we got we got a, a little bit of feedback on some YouTube videos. So some feedback from the web. Uh, I think it was episode 68 or whenever it was or 69, one of our most recent assembly episodes. But uh, Doctor. X0079 says, 
when we start showing off um, you know, some assembly examples, he recommends we use the deck instruction because it's important. Remember, we're talking about increment and decrement in assembly, how you can increase and decrease some values in RAM and registers. So he's suggesting that. I got a handful of feedback on some of my recent postings to my Cosmic Aliens update. Um, this one was pretty good here. So Kevin, uh, 12, I can't read this, 567 says, uh, he actually gave me a good suggestion, which I implemented. He, he was looking at my asteroids falling phase, and he says, you might get stuck in a part where... Um, you know, you're just going to keep getting killed by the rock. So if you ever get killed to reset the alien, to reset the asteroids, which, uh, which made sense. And I actually experienced that. So I did it. Uh, we have another person, Swinecraft, that says maybe set up some risk and reward and allow different levels um, to the game. And maybe, you know, the harder it is, the more points you get or something. Jim Gary says he likes the tracking of the laser shot. It adds a unique feature where you're trying to steer your shot for points, but you also have to be careful not to crash into something. So thanks, Jim Gary, you know, the master of programming there. Um, our good friend Wayne Aaron, friend of the show, uh, an episode or two ago, he says, uh, I was only able to watch for a few minutes, but I'll watch the rest on the replay. Sorry to Jason. I forgot to take a picture of my switcheroo. It is so great. I did add a picture of it to my Facebook post. Congratulations on 10,000 downloads. Um, very cool. Thank you, Wayne Aaron. We got an email from Giuseppe asking, he says he really likes the um, assembly language series and he's asking um, if the slides will be available. And uh, the slide presentation itself in this segment, technically that's kind of the property of uh, Steve Bjork. And so uh, we're not going to release it in any way that we don't have his approval or permission to do. And But what we are planning on doing is after we've had about 10 parts in the series which we think we're on around part five right now we still we will start to release those segments from coco talk so i will kind of strip out the assembly segments and make them available as their own video so people can watch just the assembly lessons in series so that will happen um giuseppe is what chad saying is it pronounced giuseppe okay giuseppe giuseppe okay and then i uh, he's Italian. Hey, forget about it, right? And then I I, po I posted uh, a message in Facebook saying, hey, we're always looking for topics and feedback and suggestions. Uh, send us an email or send us a message. So Richard Ivey suggested we add strippers to the show. Anybody all in favor of adding strippers? Where are we uh, going to put the poll? <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna put, David Ladd's going to be the poll. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, so, and we have to check the budget on the Coco Talk budget to see if we can get cinnamon and sugar on next week's show uh, for strippers. But Cocozilla, Cocozilla, <laughs> yeah, out of retirement, <laughs> former U.S. Marine stripper, Cocozilla. <laughs> Don't mind the battle scars. <laughs> and then, uh, but Brian Weisler had a, Weisler, I don't know if I'm going <laughs> to, William Carlin says, no male strippers, please. Yes, thank you. Um, right here. Yeah, <laughs> well, nobody can see you just there yet, Mark. Um, but Rich, uh, Brian says, I think you've talked about this, but maybe we should go into a deeper dive. But how about, how did you get on the internet with a Coco? How do you do it? And once you're there, what are people going to do? I think that's a great suggestion. And uh, perhaps Ron Delvo can give us a little peek at that today because he's got some experience. But I do feel we need to make a whole tech segment on that one time on how to do it, uh, the different ways to do it, the OS9 way, the, um, the drive wire way. Uh, there's a handful of ways, right? Uh, we need green strippers because this is the Coco show. Uh, there you go, green strippers. Yeah, I don't have any green strippers. Well. Cap Captain Kirk was a big fan of green strippers. So. <laughs> True. Uh, all right. I thought that was blue. No, she was no, green. green. They were green. So there, there we have that. So a little bit of feedback from around the web there. Thank you, everybody, who has um, written in to us. It's nice to hear from everybody. Um, Richard Lorbieski says, So when is the next round of Boomerang going to ship or be available for purchase, Richard? Richard? Monday. Monday? All right. I've spent so much time talking, I've forgotten everything. So, um, Anybody else had anything else they want to talk about this week? A project update, an acquisition, anything interesting come across your lives? Yeah, if you go to uh, show me your uh, 
cocos. There's a lot of neat stuff in there. Show us your tandies. Yeah, show us your tandies. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe Good we'll bring we'll, maybe we'll bring that up in a in a segment in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um. All right. All right. We're off to a decent start. Let's uh, let's take a look at our sponsors. Maybe we'll take a quick commercial break and then we'll come back. But let's not forget those who are contributing to the color computer community. So. We wouldn't be anything without Boisson technology, right? Now, I do want to say that commercial for the boomerang, it's nice to have memory, but I'm pretty sure it's not an accelerator, right? (laughs) When you saw that OS9 ball bouncing at warp factor 9, I think that was for uh, (laughs) entertainment purposes. I'm pretty sure that boomerang is not going to speed the cocoa up significantly. No, Um, it does not. (laughs) But it was still fun to watch, right? So... Uh, and Richard, you're back now. You, so you say new new batches will be available to order and ship Monday? Yes, Monday. Okay, excellent. So let's not forget the Coco VGA project. I believe Brendan is going to be at Tandy Assembly, which we'll talk about later on. Boisson Tech, where you can get your boomerang and your paradigm, joystick adapters, memory expanders, 6309s, sockets. Yes, dramatic effect is what Ken um, refers to it. And Rob Inman, the creator of the video, says a slight exaggeration, right? Jim Brain is gladly accepting all of the Boisson Tech re- warranty returns. So if you go to go, the number four, retro.com for retro innovations, you can get all kinds of new products for Commodore systems, TI systems, and um, he did, he, I don't think stuff. he's gladly going to accept them. I think he's accept them. <laughs> Begrudgingly accepts them. <laughs> He's under contract. He's under protest, right? <laughs> William Carlin says that was the 4 megahertz 6309 preview of the Bouncy Ball demo. Okay. It looked good. Uh, Cloud9 has been making stuff for, I don't know, 20 years going on. So Cloud9, Cloud the number 9 tech.com, all kinds of cool stuff there. If you need a drive wire cable, if you need a uh, RGB to VGA cable, uh, PS2 joystick, adapt, PS2 keyboard adapters, all kinds of stuff at Cloud9 tech. A pretty cool project. Actually, I'm actually thinking about doing this for Cosmic Aliens is making a bootable SD card since my program's in basic. And so SD pack shows you how to take an SD card and make it boot up like a ROM pack. So uh, check out sdpack.com for how to do that. If you have not gotten your very own switcheroo cable, the leading RGB to SCART cable that has a switch, then head on over to Coco3SCARTCable.com or CocoMan.biz. Don't forget, we are on the Coco TV channel on Roku. Thank you to Roger Taylor. So check us out there. We got uh, Ron Delvo verifying that we're live on Roku in the background there. Uh, if you want to get some cool Coco merchandise, you can go to our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. T-shirts, mouse pads, coffee mugs, adult diapers. Uh, I believe we've got orthopedic shoes and, and maybe rags. even some. Yeah. <laughs> we got do rags. We got knee braces, ankle braces, all kinds of stuff. Uh, if you like the cocoa, like we like the cocoa, visit imacoconut.com. We are available on the web at cocotalk.live where you can send us feedback via email and get links to all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, the Coco Crew, the podcast that started them all, available at cococrew.org. Good friend Brian Joyce, Nick Morenti's neighbor, Extructus Productions, available at FD501. We'll be talking about this man in the news segment this week, but Ed Snyder, the zipster, bringing cool cocoa products uh, at thezipsterzone.com, and that's two Ps, zip pister, uh, like a pterodactyl. So a zip pister zone.com. Uh, so check out Ed Snyder there. So there we have it. We've mentioned all those who are worth mentioning at this time. How about we take a quick commercial? Actually, you know what? Uh, we did get a question. Have we had a switcheroo commercial recently? That answer is no. So let's run a quick switcheroo commercial, and then we're going to do a bumper and a commercial, and we'll be back in just a couple minutes with more Coco Talk. Switcheroo, the RGB discard solution for the Color Computer 3. Use your Coco with a modern display. Go from RGB to composite with just the flip of a switch. The switcheroo. Artifact colors do not work in Australia. Hashtag irony. Coco3scartcable.com Hi, this is Sean Wheatley, and you're listening to Coco Talk, the original gamer, Stevie Stroh. 
We'll return after these messages. Hi, I'm Bruce Moore, and this is... Jacob Morris, gotcha. And we are the Forest of Doom guys, and the Coco Forever guys, and we are Coco Fest, and we love Stevie Strobe. What if, knowing what I know now, I could go back in time, join Tandy Corporation, and change the course of history? Coco forever. How does it feel? I'm still believing. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's me. It's Original Gamer Stevie Stro. You know, gameplay. To get your copy of a Gameplay Goodness gameplay Color Computer goodness. Gaming DVD today, gameplay head on over to 8bit256.com. There you will find several DVDs featuring Color Computer Gameplay videos by the Original Gamer Stevie Stro. So to get your very own copy of a Gameplay Goodness Color Computer Gaming DVD, head on over to the Retro Swag Shop at 8bit256.com and tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stro sent you. Radio Shack TRS-80 put the world of color computing into your home. Instant loading program packs turn any color TV into an exciting game arcade. And there's more. The color computer is an educational aid, a home management tool, and up-to-the-minute electronic information service. The programmable, expandable TRS-80 color computer from $399 only at Radio Shack, the biggest name in little computers. We now return you to Coco Talk. All right, all right, we're back. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. All right. Well, we have here. we have a special guest. Somebody sneaked in on us during our commercial break. Hey, Dennis, how are you? Good. I'm Dennis Bathory Kids, by the way. I used to be involved in the Coco community. Right now, all I do for the Coco community is uh, run a mailing list. Well, that's good. It's and something. a fine mailing list it is. Yes. Yeah, so you, you're, yes. you're you're referring to the Coco mailing list, correct? Well, if that's the one, then yeah, sure. It's been around for, gosh, it's fifteen years since we moved it from Princeton over to uh, my server. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Hey, thanks for joining us on. Um, on short notice, I know Ron invited you last week, and we were kind of in a state of turmoil last week. We weren't sure if we were going to be live or not and everything else. And so, um, yeah, thanks for being here. And um, I know Ron had posted a picture. You've made and you've made all kinds of cool stuff for the color computer in the past, right? Like music synthesizers and yeah. lowercase kits and all kinds of stuff, right? Lower kit was one of the first hardware projects, and I enjoyed doing that because... I also got the opportunity to create a whole bunch of font sets to what to go with it. They're all probably all disappeared by now. The uh, they were in they were in ROM, you know, EEPROM, and so they probably have all self erased by now. But I did um, Cyrillic and Katakana, as well as upper lowercase, so that you could just swap out the ROM and have a different. Uh, wow. Yeah, it was fun. Are you familiar with what we've been doing with uh, the color computer as far as hardware goes? I, I sort of look it over, but, you know, I don't have, uh, I don't remember anything, you know, it's really very funny. It's, it's, uh, it's all sort of faded to the point where uh, everything looks like something from my past. Well, it is something from my past. It's been 30 years since uh, I actually had a running uh, uh, Coco. So did you save any of your stuff? Mm, nothing except the manuals. Uh, I have <laughs> I have a folder full of manuals. Oh, cool! For, for, and that's my favorite was uh, color, color quaver, which was the. Uh, oh, you can't see it. There. Yeah, you can see it a little bit. Yeah. yeah and that was my my favorite thing uh, to have done was the was the music synthesizer because yeah. It was a four voice synthesizer uh, that. Um, had uh, envelopes for 
the, the, the sound as well as uh, uh, a chart of, of colors that you could use in uh, uh, timbres. So, yeah. Neat, neat. We've been talking about that a little bit. Nick Morentes, who's on the call, is working on, you know, envelope-based pattern generators for a game he's working on now. So I know this has come up more than once, having a how to generate sound on the Coco and how to generate multi-voice. Uh, Curtis Boyle, who's not with us this week, did mention that your synthesizer was one of the better sounding ones as far as how it didn't sound like the typical Coco organ like a lot of the four voice players did, you know. Well, that was the whole idea. It wasn't supposed to sound. First of all, it was four independent voices so that uh, you could have one long note against several moving notes. Uh, that was that was one of the things that I was very pleased with. And the other one was, of course, including the uh, the, the timbres. Uh, and uh, boy, I was working down deep in in binary land to to move yeah. a bit for that one and then yeah. move my binary over to assembler. But yeah, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Anyway, yeah. Was, well, would you say the color computer helped you uh, get to where you are today? Uh, wh what do you do for a living now? Um, nothing. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I, uh, no, I've, I've been self-employed for forever. I mean, since before, um, well, since right around the time I started my company, I left my job as a typist. Um, and uh, then I founded Green Mountain Micro in 1979. And it went under in 1986, um, and it, uh, it I learned a lot about um, you know the nature of creating electronic sound, um, which is my main goal because I'm a composer. That's the whole reason I got into uh, technology in the first place. I had my first synthesizer. I built my first one. I had my first commercial one in 1973, and uh, kept uh, kept at it. Um, and I sold that synthesizer, that 1973 synthesizer, only two years ago to um, uh, an artist. I don't know if you recognize his name. He goes by the name of Goche. Hmm. G O T I E. Mm -mm. No? No. He's a, he's a, a Belgian Australian pop artist. Uh, anyway, my students at college, when they heard that he had been here to, to buy my synthesizer, all went crazy. So, now, yeah. what, what processor was in the synthesizer? Say what? What kind of a processor was in the synthesizer? No, this was before. It was 1973. It was all discrete. Oh, okay. Analog synth. Are you familiar with uh, the one that, um, did we mention this last week? Uh, there was a, a Fairlight. 609. Fairlight. Yeah, the, the, the Fairlight. Yeah, no, the Fairlight preceded mine considerably. Um, uh, you know, everybody was building stuff back in those days. They, there were the Putney synthesizers, the VCS3. Uh, Moog came in uh, around that era. The the synth that I ended up getting, the reason I liked it was because it was all cross uh, cross switches. Instead of using cables or pins, all these things that were hanging out and falling around, it was basically a self-contained unit with a full keyboard, stereo speakers, um, and uh, cross, switch, cross switches. So you didn't have to plug anything in if you didn't want to. So it was kind of cool. Hmm. I had that for many years, and I got into di the digital end of the technology after I left the, the Coco world. I got into the digital end of the, end of the technology by writing about um, um, barcodes, basically, RFID barcodes and things of that sort. And and so I wrote, I don't know, a couple hundred articles for trade magazines on barcodes and RFID and 2D barcodes and so forth. And then that field collapsed because with the new copyright laws that came in in 1998, they could hire us without um, uh, without allowing us to keep our copyright. So that's when I got out of the writing business. And then uh, I started teaching college when I was 60 years old. <laughs> <laughs> got my PhD at age uh, 56, I think it was. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, Nick Morenti's just gave us a picture of you on the cover, a picture of you on the color of Color Computer Magazine. Uh, hey. fun. That one very, very well. Charlie Freiberg took that picture. Yeah, <laughs> neat looking sunglasses there, huh? <laughs> yes, he made them <laughs> from, the, uh, from the cable, put them together. and. Uh, oh, like a ribbon cable, huh? Yeah, the ribbon cable. Oh, that's neat. So. <laughs> that's cool. So that's... Uh, so yeah, as I said, it's been 30 years since I've I've uh, touched any of them, really. Well, um, who did you used to hang with uh, in the uh, Coco world? Uh, who did you know well? In 
nobody really. I mean, um, uh, because I was up in Vermont, and and essentially, you know, it was it was, it was early internet where we had to use the Com CompuServe gateway email app. So, um, you know, Marty Goodman came to visit once. Um, Did you know Wayne Day? <laughs> Ah, Wayne Day. The he publisher? was in CompuServe. You mean the publisher? No, that was no, Wayne Green. No, I didn't know Wayne Day. No. Okay. Wayne Green, I knew because I I I wrote for his magazines. I wrote for Killabone when when um, he had the special electronic music issue. I was the editor of that and oh, okay. some hardware and software for that. And I also wrote for um, uh, that. ID Markai. For what? ID Micro, the TR Sadie magazine, Wayne Green's um, publication. That was the one, right? Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I was uh, Jay Commander was the other person uh, we worked together on on that magazine, and uh, yeah, ID Micro, and then then we went to the Color Computer magazine, which was then folded into the Ziff Davis people who shut it down within a month. And then I started my own, and that lasted a year essentially before, before we ran out of money because our advertisers never paid us. Uh, Gee. <laughs> and yes. I contributed to the, the sort of the death of my company because I put the wow. a few profits I had from Micro, which were very few into that. So I lost that, lost Micro, lost pretty much lost everything. Then, so I got out. That's one of the reasons I got out of it. There was no point in staying. So you do you have a bitter taste in your mouth for, from the cocoa stuff? Only because of uh, it, it falling down, or no, no, no. That was it was a, as they say a learning experience. I was never a business person. You know, my whole reason I got into the whole computer world before the Cocoa was the Model One. The whole reason I got into it was because I felt there was a a big divide between the average person um, and the the the, uh, the programmer and the hardware designer. Yes, for sure. What these things were. Uh, they were entirely and completely at the mercy of, of somebody selling them something. And so I said, okay, you know, what I'm going to do is um, tell people how to make stuff, tell people how to program stuff, and uh, see where that goes. So I started a, a little tiny newsletter in 1979, which I sent out free to anyone who would send me a postcard with a cat. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, so they, if they sent me a postcard with cats, I would send them my newsletter. And that's, <laughs> that's how the first newsletters got out. One of those fell into the hands of a guy by the name of Jim, Jim Perry, who was just hired on as the editor for this new uh, magazine for, for Wayne Green. And he said, uh, can we use some of your newsletter content for our magazine? And I said, no, but I'll write you a monthly column if you hire me. And so he did, and that's how I got my first column in, uh, in the uh, uh, 80 micro. And wow! There, I was writing. I was writing articles uh, for four magazines a month. For a while. And, and you wrote a book on uh, hardware for the TRS-80 Model One as well, um, on how to do yeah. different mods on the on the TRS-80 or fix up problems in the TRS-80 Model One. That's right. It was a fun book. It was called the Custom TRS-80. Yeah, that's it. I've got that one. I have that book. Well, TRS-80 and other mysteries. Yes, yeah. Part of the blue book. Yeah. And my Model One has Dennis's high-speed mod in it. <laughs> and it was working up until the time it got dropped when I moved here from Philadelphia to New Jersey. And uh, my Coco has the lower kit and a TV buff in it. Yeah, the two of Dennis's products. The TV buff was not a great was not a great product. It worked, but uh, I wasn't ever satisfied with it. The rest of the things I liked, but that one I was never satisfied. With. And I have two ROMs for the the lower kit, so I have two sets of your. And somewhere, if I can find the tape for the, ca the carrot character generator, I've got more um, character sets on there. Boy, well, see, you remember names that I've forgotten. Yeah, that was the name. It wasn't the character generator. Well, yeah, I scanned in the manuals and put them up on the archive with your permission. Yeah, yeah. I just have, you know, I don't think of the, those words don't come to my mind as, as anything I ever did. But now that you remind me, yes, yeah, certainly. And then, of course, I remember being at a Rainbow Fest with you 
and you were in the I worked for Spectrum Projects at the time. Right. And you were in the next row and you were giving out buttons that said, I'll teach you a thing or two. Now which of, <laughs> which of the fests were were you at? The one where I won where wore a uh, white gown or the one where I wore a prison outfit? The prison outfit, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I think that was Brunswick, New Brunswick. That was Princeton, yeah. That was yeah, Princeton. Princeton. Yeah, and that was one of my favorites. Because... <laughs> You're going to have to take some aspirin. Your brain is going to swell a little bit. <laughs> well, Dennis, Dennis is one of my favorite people because he made my Model 1 so cool. I had the fastest Model 1 in the East. <laughs> and it was not easy. You know, it, to be honest, his, his book wasn't such that you could just do A, B, and C and have something that worked. You had my buddy Tom did most of the work, and he knew what he was doing. And yep. he had to debug my expansion interface to get the memory timing correct. It was a lot of work, but at the end, it was very satisfying. It was fun, yeah. I had that actually. I had that Model One until 1992, um, and I continued to use it to write all my articles uh, for the magazine until 1992. And that's when I finally got a uh, uh, um, an, uh, an early Windows PC. But then you you know to bring this in back into the color computer world, you had an article on how to put a Model One keyboard into a Coco. I did because I I liked the full travel keyboard, and uh, the only way to get a full travel keyboard obviously was to make a modification. Uh, and I had a cable, long cable on it, um, actually because I like to sit by the wood stove, and so I had a long cable to where the computer sat. Nice. <laughs> That's anyway, cool. <clears throat> other things, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe my memory will come back. <laughs> well, we, I got a couple of questions from the live audience too. So Curtis Boyle, who's one of our regular co-hosts, but can't be here today due to uh, Canadian border restrictions, um, he he's asking uh, Dennis, do you remember your ambient music demo you did at a Coco Fest? The room played different notes depending on where people were walking in the room. Oh gosh. I'd forgotten about that, but it was based on, well, it ended up becoming um, a, an installation um, where, um, um, let me see if I can describe this. I worked with a sculptor in Montana who created an entire uh, civilization. Uh, the civilization was um, uh, all sort of artificial people and so forth and it was all part of a a room and in this room i had a group of four cocos connected together um to a master coco which pulled in on a analog to digital converter board i built 17 uh, infrared sensors and they determined where people were walking in the room and how they used the room then um, I fed out of that from the computers and tape machine controllers, I fed back sound. And the principle was that if you interfered in a space in the room that was infrequently used, the sound would become this massive, overwhelming pile of stuff. Whereas if you walk into the room through the main door, which was used frequently, uh, the sound slowly learned that that was a frequently used space and didn't um, uh, didn't react. So over the course of the four or five weeks that it was installed, I had a set of, I had self-modifying code and a data set that learned how the, the room was used and responded differently. So wow. That, yeah, so that was installed at the Yellowstone Art Center in Montana, and I believe it was 1980. And that was that was sort of the pinnacle of my uh, uh, attempt at very early uh, self-learning programs. Wow, that's impressive. Self-modifying uh, code here is uh, kind of a joke <laughs> <laughs> in our little group here. Yeah, it's... In days, the machines were too slow to, to access large data sets. So what I did was actually change how the, the behavior of the program depending on the information that was coming in. It would actually change its jumps and its, uh, 
and its uh, internal internal fixed data. The fixed data became different as the learn as the room was used. So it was a really interesting uh, experiment in that it actually worked. And that was the thing that was the funnest. Right. No one thought it actually worked, and by the end of the five weeks, the room was behaving entirely differently from the way it behaved when I first turned it on. You first turned it on, and the people would walk into the room, and the system would go crazy. And gradually, as more and more people walked in through that entrance, the, the, the system forgot that it was an important space. Whereas if they walked into a corner, which nobody really went to, the, the whole thing would go go crazy. And in every corner and every part of the room, there were, there were these clay and cloth and uh, fur creatures that she had created for the civilization. So it was, yeah, it was fun. Wow. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah. No pictures of this stuff? Uh, yeah, I have photographs of it. It's on... Um, if you go to my main website, which is Malted Media, like Malted Milk, maltedmedia.com slash Bathory, B-A-T-H-O-R-Y, there will be a link to a, an installation called Invoca a Lupo. And that has the photograph of the... Um, uh, installation and even a an excerpt of the sound from that room. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, Bathory B A T H O R Y. Okay. Find me, and if you look at the column on the left side, there will be I think something that says landmark project or something like that. Okay, so I found your site. Music, uh, performance, down. landmark projects. Okay, so what am I looking for? Boca al Lupo. Is it there? Let me just bring it up here because I can't. It's not in yeah, there. okay. In, okay. in Boca al Lupo, 1986. That's the one. Okay. okay. So the installation, those are the creatures. Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. And these yeah. black and white photographs are very... Surreal, too. Yes. And if you move down, you'll see what I looked like in 1986 as well. Wow, this is the setup here? Yeah, that's it. Wow. Cross connect. This looks. No need for computer covers, huh? No. Does this. Did did you by any chance have Paul T. Barton help you work on this? (laughs) 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 I love wires. Uh, Okay, here you are here. Yeah, there I am. There's some of the uh, artwork. Huh? It looks like a, some type of mask here, huh? Uh, I think that's... Uh, yeah, yes, it, it is. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, there was a speaker embedded in that. that was oh, neat. Of, yeah, neat. Yeah. And there are many more photographs of that. But those yeah. Are Did you have an amplifier hooked up, or was it just a, a sound? 17, 17 channels of sound to match the 17 analog input. Oh. So, yeah. Did, uh, didn't anyone tell you that our computer didn't have a sound chip? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Well. You did I, well. Yeah, I put the link in the live chat if anybody wants to check a look at that. So that is really cool. And how, Ron? How did you how did you run into Dennis? Ron, you you're the one who ran into Dennis and invited him to the show, right? Yeah, um, it, he's always been a favorite of mine. Um, and I'm looking at the magazines and I'm seeing his face all the time and I'm thinking, well, is this guy around, you know, and I remember seeing him. So I bug him every once in a while. Yeah. I'm he did begging. exist. What? <laughs> what? You mean he wasn't a marketing gimmick? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure everybody's grateful for the Coco mailing list too. It's a, it's a pretty popular, oh, yes. uh, absolutely popular way to communicate. Curtis Boyle had also mentioned that you had a uh, uh, an, a series on on assembly language that was on cassette tape, and I believe that's available to download uh, the digital form of those uh, cassettes. Oh, for download, including and a download of the actual. I happen to have this here. This is the entire the entire book. It's what's called a program text, so that um, as you as you go through it, you li- the cassettes are audio cassettes, so you actually listen to them. Mm-hmm. It becomes a data a data stream every once in a while, uh, and you load the program in the data stream, and you follow along in the book, and you do the 
you do the programming exercises and then answer the questions in the, the margin. There's a column. Uh, uh, um, oh. And as, if you answer a question wrong, you go back again and you keep doing it until you get it right. And once you've gotten it right, you can move on to the next section. Wow, that's really neat. That's pretty uh, innovative. Is that is that a uh, a kind of a learning um, style? It's called programmed learning. It was very yeah. popular in the 19, uh, 1970s and 80s for before we had you know computer reinforcement of learning where we had these looping lessons. In those days, it was done with with questions and answers in the margins of books, and and as long as you got the answer right, you can move on to the next. It's like a mm. reward. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and it almost sounds like a learning flow chart too, where you can't ex you can't move down to the next node until you've kind of finished something here. Yeah, right. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Neat. That is very cool, man. What an what an interesting history, huh? Well, we're very. The programming days and the hardware days were fun. You know, there were there were you know, you were constantly kludging something to make it work because everything was so slow. You know, and, and my interest was music, and and music is it's so demanding of of resources, and uh, you know it wasn't until you actually got to uh, the first uh, gigahertz chips that that you could get a ris reasonable uh, uh, musical output, and now of course I can output uh, full orchestral pieces. For mm. You know, now today, of course, it's quite different, but it's a uh, I couldn't have imagined in when I got my first uh, Model One, actually, in, in 1978, that we would evolve to that point. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. The first time I heard classical music was on the color computer. And there used to be these programs you could just load and execute, and they'd play like box, fugue, and D minor, and things like that, you know. And so all the Beethoven's Fifth. And so these little demo programs I listened to, and to me it was interesting because it was, you know, electronic on my computer. But it, it also got me an appreciation for classical music that I still have to this day. So I, I credit to Coco for me liking classical music, you know, because I heard it in a cool way, you know. Very funny. That's great. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's basically my whole story. I mean, you know, the, there were the good parts and there were the bad parts. When, sure. Um, my, as some of you know, the custom TRS-80, the Model 1 book, um, that sold extremely well. It was one of the best-selling books for one year and the publisher did a second printing and then there was this whole little scam that happened where the publisher overprinted everybody's book in the custom series um too much to pay for went bankrupt and sold all the books as scrap except that he sold them to a company he owned in the next state and went on to continue selling the books without having to pay any royalty oh Shoot. wow we were all very very unhappy yeah number of people who completely got out of the the uh the writing business because they were so bitter about that yeah yeah we hear some of those stories about people who have been burned and um you know are also people who used to advertise in the rainbow some of those guys got burned um you know and i think if we look back now and you have the benefit of time to look back in the past. Hopefully we can all see that there was probably a lot more good and a lot more enjoyment that happened than maybe some of the little things. And I think a lot of us just fans and consumers, we never had the burn that some of you creators had. Um, but one thing that I think, I'm, I'm not sure how, you're obviously familiar with what's going on in your Cocoa mailing list, but um, are you familiar with just how much is going on with new hardware and new software and how this is whole kind of revival of, Coco enthusiasm and stuff and it's like the the glory days are here again i've been reading about it and it fascinates me that that there's so much new material being produced of course i go to the the coco um facebook page so i can see photographs of this stuff mm -hmm. with their new hardware designs all beautiful uh, let, let me interrupt you for one second here okay so you are the creator of the coco mailing list yes and you're um, also you're also on Facebook. Yes. Okay, because usually there's this divide where it's the list and there's Facebook, and there's not a lot of cross pollination going on there. You've got the diehard hardcore loyalists that are into let's keep it black and white on the list, and then you've you got the sh the shiny, fluffy, foofy Facebook people, and there ne never seems to be a lot of people meeting in the middle there. And you're one of them, and you're the creator of the list. So, God bless you. <laughs> 
Are you going to get yourself a Coco 3? Uh, no. All, all of that stuff is, all of the stuff, as I said, manuals and a few sort of entertaining little things are gone. Um, the only thing I've actually kept that is sort of entertaining box called um, the Lower Kit Museum. <laughs> so when you open the box, there's my original wire wrapped lower kit and all the variations of those from the from the first one to the last one. Wow. It's really entertaining to look at this thing because it has a uh, first one, which is like tons of little wires everywhere because, you know, the documentation is quite good, but a little bit opaque in those days. And so especially figuring out how the 6847 works and how to make it, um, you know, respond to an external request was tricky at, at the beginning. Uh, and uh, so I, 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 I wire wrapped this monster. It looks like a bird's nest. It's like 3D. It's not like just wire wrapped from the bottom. There's all this stuff going to the top because I had to, to try and hook it up to, uh, you know, an EEPROM socket to make sure that it works. Anyway, it was a lot of fun. That's, I have that and I have my documentation. Everything else um, well, I gave away to people over here. Well, That's if you get cool. the itch, this is the place to find out how to get in touch with another machine. Even the Model 1, I thought maybe you would you would probably like to have again, wouldn't you? Nope. No? No, I'm, I'm you know, I don't, uh, I'm not a retro guy. You know, as a, as a composer, I'm always looking ahead. And although I archive my past projects, I, I don't go back and, and kind of relive any of that. Never been never been in my my personality to do that so hmm. this is your first attempt at, at going back wouldn't you say <laughs> I got the request and i said oh what the heck <laughs> I installed zoom on my on my on this terrible little 25 dollar tablet i got at walmart uh and uh so i said all right i used it because i do pa i do mentoring with a, a group of people uh, getting their phds and every Tuesday at noon, Eastern time, we, we do a, an hour and a half mentoring session. And so um, uh, with this installed, I, I saw the message and it said, okay, join us. I said, okay, why not? Let's give it a shot. Let's All right. That's cool. So thank you very much for the invite. Yeah, so, thanks for being here. Yeah, um, yeah, I've been back in the Coco hobby for like three years now, and it was eye-opening to me. Um, there's been a monthly podcast called the Coco crew that's been going on for three years. And that I think really put a spotlight on the community, um, was primarily, uh, started off as a, basically an infomercial for Coco Fest. They were really big on wanting to get people to come to Coco Fest, which has now been going on 27 years. I've been to three of them now. That's amazing. I went to one. Yeah. Which one did you go? God, I, I'm having trouble remembering uh, actually, let me bring up my journal, and I'll tell you exactly which one. Uh, it was. It was. Uh, are they all in Chicago? Because that one was in Chicago. Yeah, they have been. Yeah, mostly. Well, there was a couple in Princeton, wasn't there? No, well, there was Penfest, right? Let me just see if I can. Find I went to the '84 Rainbow Fest. Um, Dennis Curtis Boyle is asking if you have any interest in using emulators at all, just to fire up an old machine. Well, let me answer the first, the other question first. It was April 26, 1997. 1997. Uh, yeah. So that was 21 years ago. So I don't know. <laughs> anyway, Sheesh. now as for emulators, yes, actually, uh, the only emulator I currently have is actually a Model 1 emulator because I wrote a piece of, uh, uh, ex uh, of performance art music um, uh, and I wanted to run the program again. In hmm. order to run the program, I needed I needed a Model One, which I don't have, so I got the emulator, and it worked, and which was really good. So I was able to print out all of the sheets of that. But that's the only the, uh, the only interest I have. I, I mean, I'm slammed with all kinds of work. I do music engraving for people, uh, even though I'm a you know I should be retired at 69. Uh, <laughs> I still do uh, do uh, a lot of work for other folks, and so. Um, I don't really have time to use an emulator unless I'm actually trying to to bring forth a project that I need to look at again, which is fairly fairly rare. 
So you love your work. So it's it's as though uh, it's your hobby all, to, all at the same time, right? Well, yeah. My my composition is. I mean, mm -hmm. I've uh, over eleven hundred compositions. I've been performed all around the world, and uh, you know, so that's my thing. I mean, that's what I've always want. Uh, what I've always done. What I did before I was involved in the small computers, and what I've done since. Hmm. The only bad year I had was, I think it was 1982, where I didn't write any music because it was at the pinnacle of my work on the Coco, and it took so much time. It was taking 18 hours a day to develop the new designs. I mean, there's no... Circuit boards were done all by hand at the time. I mean, literally with... Um, I don't even remember what it was called. It was a purple tape, uh, opaque tape that you used, and you actually taped it on transparencies to to create your circuit board. Wow. Did you um, um, employ people? Yeah, I had six people working for me. Wow. Yeah, and they did they did uh, copying of software, soldering of circuit boards. Uh, one was handling sales of stuff. Uh, and I forget, basically, you know, everybody worked together. We all earned the same salary, except for me when I had to give my salary back because we didn't have enough money. Yeah. Wow. So that's it. So that's my whole story. <laughs> what were you going to say, Nick? Um, no, I'm nothing, I don't think. <laughs> well, I thought so. I stepped over someone. Nice to see your fo actual photograph, Nick. My. Oh, yes. <laughs> Assuming that's you. Uh, yes, it is. Okay, good. Before the operation, <laughs> the, the, the sex change operation. <laughs> well, all right, I gotta go. Thank all right, you. hey, thank thank you so much for joining us. It was great to have you. What a nice treat. Yeah, you're welcome anytime. <laughs> yeah, Curtis, yeah. Curtis had one question about his famous ancestor. Who oh. you share you share a last name with? For that, you go to Bathory.org. It's all there. Okay, Bathory.org. C-H-O-R-Y.org. Okay. You can listen to my whole opera. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thanks for all you have done for us. Oh, does, I want to look because you mentioned your ROMs and your your things. I don't know if you're familiar with a project now called the Coco VGA that has replaced the um, VD, the VDG with um, the ability to output the VGA, and he's added new modes. There's a 64 column mode, and he's added now programmable character sets too. This is all done through like an FPGA, but it's a new Coco project that reminded me of what you were explaining. You know, back back then when there were no FPGAs to be had. Yeah, the, new fonts. The, the era for me. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. That's kind kind of coming full circle. There's a new project now that's doing what you did. You know couple years ago <laughs> 30 35 <laughs> i was in the midst of my coco stuff anyway yeah. really cool work to be done here all right thanks for joining us thanks, thanks a lot. lot awesome bye dennis bye bye Ann. you got to hit the hang up button somewhere <laughs> Lower right corner, usually. Leave meeting. And leave meeting or something like that, yeah. All right. I don't know where it is, so I'm just going to turn it off. That's easy. There you go. That'll work. I can... Let me see what I can do. I can stop your video. I put you on hold. <laughs> Look at this picture. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. All right. <laughs> so we'll get it figured out. That was cool. Well, that's um, that's cool, Ron. Thanks for inviting him. And what yeah. a, what a treat. To have him cool. on the show like that, huh? Yep. He's a busy guy, evidently, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. So now we're playing. Now you hang up first. Now you hang up first. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All we right. need some other personalities to come on now. Yeah. Well, we got you, Ron. You're a personality. No, no. We didn't, <laughs> no. Uh, it, it would definitely raise our standards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We um, need uh, that Hogue guy or whatever his name is. Hog, I, I, Hogue. I, I, Frank Hogue? Yeah. Frank should come on. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, I actually have, um, uh, there we go. He found the hangout button or it turned off his tablet, whichever came first. I have something else I want to show you guys that is kind of breaking. And then... Um, breaking? Yeah, and for, oh, so um, Curtis Boyle says that Frank Hogg is busy touring the country right now. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, but he's he's got internet. Okay, there you go. Well, all right, let's take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back, and I'm going to show you guys something, and then uh, maybe a discussion, and then um, i can get some news items to cover as well. So we'll be back in just a few. That was great, man. That was very unexpected. That was two weeks in a row. We've had some just nice, pleasant surprises, like the VCF West, and now having Dennis on. That's great. See what happens when Curtis is not here and Grant isn't here? It's just amazing what the, the, the how the, the quality of the show just goes. <laughs> Curtis on the left side there. Yeah, uh, Ken is saying, how about Boss Hog? Can we get Boss Hog? Is that... <laughs> right. can remember when Jim Brain was the biggest celebrity we could get. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll be back in just a few, guys. Thanks. Hi, this is Max Jackson live from Coco Fest. And you listen to The Real Game, Steve Shrow. Hey everybody, this is Bill Noble, co-author of Nitrous 9. You are listening to Coco Talk Live, the leading live Coco Talk show. Good day, mates. This is Nick Marionette, author of such color computer titles as Donut Disaster, Rupert Rhymes, and Rockstar Pilot. And I am here today to tell you about the world's most fabulous operating system, OS9. OS9 and its current incarnation Nitrous 9 is the most advanced operating system ever created. And what makes it so good? Ease of use. I find OS9 so incredibly intuitive that I haven't once cracked open the user manual. And yet I've been able to create such incredible games faster than the time it takes to sing Walsing Matilda. Using OS 9, I expect my next game, Funstar, will be done this weekend and distributed exclusively on ROM cartridge. OS 9 forever. Any resemblance to actual events to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. What's going on everybody? The Original Gamer Stevie Stroh here and I want to talk to you about Amacoconut.com. If you love the color computer like I love the color computer, then you gotta visit Amacoconut.com, your one-stop shop for all of your candy color computer links needs. There you'll find links to blogs and podcasts and project sites and emulators and downloads and groups and communities. If you love the color computer, head on over to Amacoconut.com. That's I-M-A, Coconut.com. Tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stroh sent you. Coco forever, people. It's a Radio Shack Merry Christmas. This year, I needed to give a real family pleaser. Honey, please help me with this budget. How about a new game, Dad? Please. And I found it. Radio Shack's Color Computer 2. On sale for just $99.95. It entertains, educates, manages. It's expandable and affordable. Now that really pleases me. The Color Computer 2. Sale price for Christmas. Only at Radio Shack. Right. Yeah, that's just for that's if you if you want to run at five twelve. Okay. We are back. We're back. Welcome back, everybody. We're back from the break. I don't know if you guys had heard me mention, but I muted you during the break. So if you guys, whatever you're talking about, you heard it, but I didn't hear it. So, um, okay. So we are back from commercial. I got something I want to show you guys. I have um, something new and exciting. And I'm going to tell you what's going on right now. So I think you guys, most most of us at least, are aware of the fact that I'm trying to evolve the show Coco Talk into a few other shows like Retro Talk and Geek Talk. And um, if you aren't aware, the, um, the artwork and the logos and the images that we have for this show and for our merchandise and our swag shop, they're all they are all drawn by um, Joel M. Adams. He's an artist who happens to be the son of Rick Adams, author of Temple of Rom and Shanghai and Bomb... Which one is Bomb Squad? 
I can't remember. Bomb threat. Bomb threat. There you go. Now working on Omnistar. So it's kind of there's a Coco connection there, right? So Joel Adams is making all the artwork we see on our merchandise. Well, I have I asked Joel quite some time ago to come up with some logos for Coco Talk and, and Retro Talk and Geek Talk. And we have them, and I'm going to reveal them for the first time anywhere. Now, none of this has been uploaded yet, so they're not available yet. But they will be available as merchandise, but more importantly, they're going to be the logos for the show. So are you guys ready to see the new and improved Coco Talk logo? Everybody? Drum roll. Drum roll, yeah. please. All right, so I need to find my full screen option here. And here we go. What do you think of this? This is... The brand new Coco Talk logo. I like it. It's kind of cool. Classic, but 21st century, too. It's, it's different. Yeah. So it has a modern feel to it. It does have a modern feel to it. Is it a ROM pack? <laughs> Is it a ROM pack? <laughs> it's not saying it's a Coco here. project, but it could be. Um, so that is Coco Talk. And here we have Retro Talk. Look at that. That's pretty cool, right? We got the old uh, screw-on connectors here for the old TV switcher switcheroo boxes, right? Your F connectors, your um, screw-ons. You got a couple of uh, coaxial connections here. Oh no, I thought switcheroo was trademark. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's a cool little logo for Retro Talk, and then last but not least, we have one for that's Coco Talk. Hold on. And here's Geek Talk. I like this one. Look at that. Like an old TV and a microphone and everything. That looks pretty cool, right? Mm-hmm. Sure does. Yeah. Well, so where, why not? Where, where's the logo for Troll Talk? <laughs> it's got a picture of two angry Muppets on it, so that's the one. So, um, the computer under a bridge. <laughs> Down by the river. Down by, under, a, in a van. By <laughs> the bridge. Down by the river. That's where you're <laughs> going to wind up. <laughs> and James Diffendiver says, if you really want to make money from YouTube, try adding cat talk and dog talk and horse talk. <laughs> the dagger the dagger and retro talk? I'm not sure if that's a dagger. That's just art. I don't it's, know if that... uh, spade terminals for the, for the switcher box you, know, you put on your TV. Yeah. You can bring it back up, but yeah, if you look at it, let's see, it's got the two spade terminals in them. Mm, yeah, well, I, I'm having a hard time finding my full screen thing. Here's my full screen thing. All right, so yep, uh, yep. where did it go? Here's Retro Talk. The daggers? These yeah, there? Yeah, so you got a coax F connector. And yeah, and these are your spade, spade connectors. Yeah. Yeah, and these are like for the, the old screw. Yeah, because this, this actually looks like one of those boxes, right? The RF switch box. Every time I saw that box, I thought to myself, Ah, I need a screwdriver. Yeah, right? <laughs> and so this actually is the RF switch box. So you've got your, your different inputs and outputs and your screw-ons. and got it's one just, for your coming TV and then one for your computer. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of cool, right? It's retro. And it's, it's, it's all done by the same artist who's done all of our other artwork so far. So um, cool stuff. So I like it. And I want to thank Joel for doing that. Um and Actually, he has the switcher behind the T and the A. Oh, uh, yeah. The switch is right back here. Yeah. Where you switch it back and yep. forth. Yep. yep, 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 yep. Slider. Yeah. Now, if we did a show called Troll Talk, could we still have trolls trolling Troll Talk? Absolutely. <laughs> trolls trolling the trolls, talking about trolls 24-7. Yeah. Oh, so Rick Adams just joined in. He says, wow, Joel's been busy. Yes. And so, yeah, so Joel, you know, he has a life, and he, I can't expect him just to drop everything and, and make something. But I will send him a message and, and give him some ideas or some requests. And then when he has the time and the inspiration, because he is an artist, you know, he also needs to kind of just, like, let the inspiration hit him. So when it when it hits him, he he gives me stuff, and that was kind of cool stuff there. Now speaking of Rick Adams and Joel Adams, how about we do a real quick look here at a very cool screenshot? If I could find it, I'm gonna try to scroll through Discord right now. Um, Omnistar. So Rick Adams has put up a a new and improved picture of Omnistar. Let me switch back over to that real quick, and I have not played this latest version. But Rick's new game that he's working on called Omnistar, 
is pretty cool. And he's added the picture of the, what is it called? Dodeca. How do you say that word? Five-sided. Do- dodecahedron. Dodecahedron. There you go. That sounds right. Dodecahedron. So he's added the actual image of it. And it's a really cool game. And if you look kind of at the quadrants of the screen here, in the top left here, you kind of see some text where it's telling you that the um, the bad robots are moving from node to node. These nodes are represented by these different letters. Um, you've got command status over here. When you um, are typing in your different commands, your inventory or your workspace is down here. Um, when you enter a node, if there are items in the node, you'll see them in the bottom right-hand corner. These are like It's like in a text adventure game. If you walked into a room, it'd say, in this room, you see a lamp and a lantern and a bucket of oil or whatever. So you kind of see what's in the room here in the bottom. Um, there's also like your adjacent nodes. This is like if I'm in one node, it's going to tell you what nodes you can go to. Um, tells you the name of your current node and the percentage of your node. Here's your health status bar and the Omnistar status bar. And it's kind of a cool game because you are a hacker. You're moving from node to node and you have to find these programs. You load the programs. They end up being in your inventory over here on the left and you have to figure out through trial and error what the programs do by executing them. And so, and I were kind of relate it to some of the flasks in Dungeons of Daggereth. You know, some flasks will hurt you. Some flasks will heal you. Some flasks will um, do damage to the bots that are in the room. Those are like the bad guys. Some flasks will do um, damage to the node itself, and you have to try to take out all the nodes. And as you take out these nodes, the percentage of Omnistar goes down. So it's a lot of moving around, avoiding bad bots in the systems, finding programs, seeing what the programs do. So to me, it reminds me of a text adventure, a little bit of a role-playing game, a little bit of Dungeons of Daggereth. And it's, it's pretty cool. So I have been um, trying a few different versions of it. This latest version that's got the map is new. So uh, it's kind of cool. So look for, you know, coming soon, a new game from Rick Adams, Omnistar. And it's pretty cool, right? Well, that node talk reminds me of Fidonet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's Grant yeah. Leedy. Is this show still going? It provides good entertainment when taking a dump. Okay. Uh, and unfortunately, my soundboard's not working yet. Uh, I'm going to have to send this one off to go for retro to get it repaired. Oh, here it is. Speaking of dumps. All right. Soundboard just came back. Okay. Um, so that was cool. And that was going on in Discord. And we talk about Discord, right? So there's a link to our Discord server. If you're, if you're not familiar with Discord and you want to chat with us during the week, we have text conversations going on, kind of like an IRC chat happening all the time. We have voice conversations going on randomly all the time. So, you know, Discord's where all the Coco people hang out. So you might want to check that out. Um, all right, so that was my little reveal of some new artwork. So hopefully that'll be available in the swag shop soon as new T-shirts and mugs and um, stuff like that. And it's, it's kind of cool. I like it. Uh, I've got news to cover. But before we do, before we cover some news, I thought we might want to have a quick host discussion because if I could find my web page, um, a, a kind of an interesting topic came up. And, and I also want to um, share with you guys another kind of cool group on Facebook that uh, we've just been invited to. And, um, and it's got, it kind of got some crossover. And I think these, uh, some members of this group might be good people to join us on a future retro talk. But this is a group that's called Vintage Gaming and Operating Systems. And um, Jeff Wood is a guy who invited me in, and he's been, I think he's maybe somewhat new to some of the Coco and um, MC10 groups, but he was asking about podcasts. He goes, are there any Coco podcasts? Are there any Coco media shows I could share in my group? And we told him about Coco Crew and Coco Talk. Um, they posed a question here as kind of a poll, and I thought this might be an interesting um, maybe host discussion, but... Um, can retro gaming be all inclusive? And and the longer story to that question is, um, you know, what does it mean to be retro? Because some people are kind of loyal saying retro should be only on real hardware, you know, using the original systems on a CRT. And if you're using a flat screen on a vintage system, you're not retro. If you're using an emulator, you're not retro, you know? And so some people have a very pure point of view on what it means to be a retro person and be part of the retro hobby. And so the kind of the, the topic or the poll was, is that can somebody be retro? Can you be in the retro club? 
um, by not necessarily being a purist on only original hardware. It, would we, like for us in the Coco community, are we okay with people? Tell me why oh, shit. Can he do that? Bam. Oops. Yeah, wrong button. Yeah, so let's use our community as an example, right? Do we care if somebody's running a Cocoa Pie or VCC or MAME or XROAR? Or, you know, I, I think we know, I think that's a rhetorical question for us. But in general, there are some extremely loyal retro people that say you got to have the bare metal original hardware. Uh, it's David Ladd's sake running off a floppy disk. Um, so, you know, what do you guys think about that? I have both. I have both. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes if I go it's traveling, not it's it's not practical to have all 100% retro hardware, especially like floppies and even uh, monitors, because mm -hmm. there's very few available at any kind of affordable price. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's different levels of uh, being retro. I mean, you can be half retro or full retro. Half retro is only if you're running emulators or whatever, and you know, obviously might not, might not be able to afford or find genuine hardware, but you can still get into the whole retro thing via emulators or FPGAs or whatever. So you could say you're half retro, um, but full retro is when you also have the um, the hardware, the original hardware running as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's not a bad thing. Um, right. It just depends on what you can afford or whatever. Or, yeah, either monetarily or space-wise. Some people still have a lot of space to dedicate to stacking stuff around. Yeah. But even if you went true retro, then like two meg boards and the SDCs and uh, a lot of the more modern stuff that is available now, upgrades, would not be available because, I mean, they, they weren't there when they were originally released, you know, the original hardware. It, mm -hmm. it was too expensive. Right. It was not, it was not practical to have a two meg board. I mean, the Not one right. meg, I, I had a one meg board, uh, the, the Disto one, and I, I uh, you know, I was able to heat my entire house because of it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think it's raining outside right now. I hear, I hear weather in the background. I don't know if you guys are hearing that through my microphone. Um, what about David Ladd, Lord of the Floppy? David, you with us? And while Crickets. we're waiting... While we're waiting on David to unmute, what about Al Hartman? Al Hartman, we know you've got a lot of real retro hardware. What are your thoughts on pure versus kind of emulated and hybrid? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no nope comment. More crickets. All right. So um, Rick Adams says, you can take my Coco SDC. When you pry it from my cold, dead hands. <laughs> yeah. James wanted to know if uh, you've been warned for spamming yet. If I've been what now? Warned for spamming. spamming. No, where? Uh, I think the uh, Facebook group we were talking about. Have I been warned for spamming? Yeah. No, on this Facebook group here, the Vintage Gaming System? Yeah. No, because Jeff actually invited me to that group, and Jeff is the oh, one who right. shared the post. Matter of gotcha. fact, I, I asked him to share our um, show today, so it wasn't coming from me. Oh, no um, so, yeah. Have you and had I, any trouble? Uh, I have not had any more butt hurt or um, complaints <laughs> about, um, about spamming good. any groups recently. Um, what does James Diffendaffer say? He's saying, I built the first 128K RAM upgrade for the Coco 1, but the RAM was too expensive to justify buying the RAM for it. Um, that would have been back in the day. Yeah, you know yeah, I had a RAM disc, 128k for my Model One, uh, Coco. Hmm. And I had software to put. Um, I think there were, was it 64k banks? Two of them, or four banks of 32. I don't know. It was fun. When you uh, turned it off, all your work went away. <laughs> yeah, true, true, true. Uh, James Jones says those who can maintain them awesome more power to them but some components just aren't available does pure preclude non-tandy hardware even available in period um 
Yeah, so yeah, if it's a third party, is that even pure? Because back then you had like the J&M disc controllers and you know all kinds of other stuff, right? So Burke and Burke, Disto. So um, I think it does. I, I, I think uh, yeah, a third party or what? It's still the retro because it's all going into the a color computer, a real kind of color computer. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, would that include a Gorilla Banana printer? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wow. Did you get that printer inside your Coco, Ron? <laughs> no, I never had one. I just thought it was an interesting name at the time. Gorilla the Banana. Banana. It's the same as the Tandy Line Printer 7. The oh, yeah? They're a Seikosha. It's made by Seikosha. Oh. All right. Saved on moving parts by only having one pin and hammer. Wow. One pin, so it, was, it wasn't even a nine pin. Did that pin have to like? No, no it was a rotary. It was a rotary. Yeah, it was. It rotated around and it did strike. It was uh, like the DMP one hundreds, really uh, loud. The gorilla I heard of that only had one pin, as I remember. But maybe it was somebody else's. So, so I seen rotary ones too. So. Curtis is saying that Gorilla Banana used to have full color, full page color ads. They did. Yeah, so yeah. some people are talking about the vinyl experience too, like with music. Like, do you need to listen to music from the 1950s on the original vinyl with a turntable, or can you listen to the digital version of it? Is it the same experience? And are there some, uh, you know, hearing some of the imperf imperfections of like the popping and hissing sounds of the needle and stuff? Uh, and the fidelity the wow and flutter the wow if you, have, if you have popping and hissing that means you never took care of your records very well <laughs> I, had, I had a dog one time uh golden retriever we first one of our first ones and we had records laying out and stuff and the dog came over to a couple of the um 33s you know and the dog was doing uh, uh, <laughs> scratching <laughs> the heck out of him. Oh, wait don't stop i had all my records in a stereo stand with my stereo on it and there was enough gap above the record albums that were sitting on their sides that the cat would climb in there hang out i decided that that made a great scratching post oh. so all the top of my albums have cats oh wow wow well, did um, you have them in like in the wooden peach crates too for your albums uh, yes, I had some in. in uh, yeah. Melbourne. Did there your was... cat cat scratch fever? <laughs> oh no, no! A, a true collector would have the Ronco record selector. I mean, uh, <laughs> I yes, had uh, the Ronco oh, record cleaner that would vacuum and brush the, the dust out of the grooves. Right. Um, I, ha I have. By the way, I was thing. away when when you asked me the question. I believe in the classic hardware. I, I prefer that. I like emulation as far as it goes, but none of the emulators are 100%. And the right. only thing that's 100% for me is the classic hardware. Right. So I, I don't, I don't, um, if someone wants to experience the experience and they want to use an emulator, I'm fine with that because collecting the classic hardware can be very expensive and getting it running again, you need some expertise. Right, especially if you have to maintain it or you have things like the capacitors that fail. And if you don't know how to solder and desolder, that can become a challenge. Um, so I'm really loving the, the Pi, the Raspberry Pi. Right. And RetroPi and all the other emulators that allow people to play the software, to play the games and use the software. And that's great. But I like having my original Model 1. I like having my, my TDP 100. I like having my dragon, and those are for me much more fun than the emulator. Right, right, right. And there's, you know, so you have your different emulators, and um, uh, James Jones is saying, uh, how accurate must an emulator be? He goes, there was talk of Mame playing floppy noises, which it does now. Yeah. Um, probably nobody wants simulation of uh connector corrosion <laughs> do we want to emulate <laughs> hardware failure <laughs> yes, i would like a timex emulator that when you tap the side of the computer you lose everything you typed in 
Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> the, the cartridge port with the 16K RAM pack. You know, what, you know I've, t I've spent many years teaching IT, and a lot of times we teach things. We use um, simulations. We use virtual machines and stuff. And, um, and you know, I have a lot of students will do a lab. And, you know, if you're doing a lab and a virtual machine and everything goes right, some, you, you know, it's like, oh, I, just, I followed the steps and everything worked. And you feel good that it, that nothing went wrong, but honestly, I like it when things in the lab don't go right because in the real world, things don't go right, and now we have to learn, and now this troubleshooting is a better opportunity. What do you got there, Ron? I have an MC-10 that on occasion, uh, uh, the uh, I guess I have to go in, open it up, and resolder the socket there. But uh, I had, when I was using my original one back in the day, you would type in, Type in, type in, type in, type in. Move the um, PC just a little bit, and then it would disconnect. <laughs> yeah. Then you get well, the prompt again. Well, yeah. you learned... What was that effect again? Where did it go? Uh, oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Morota says you can't use an MC10 emulator as a doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't support Windows either. <laughs> <No. laughs> <laughs> yes, the MC-10 is smaller than the Coco by quite a bit. Yeah, I so. learned back in the Model 1 days when I was typing in programs out of books and magazines, every time I got up to go to the bathroom or go get a cup of coffee or a glass of water, do a C-save. Yeah, save and save often. It was called save and pray. Save yeah. and pray, especially on tape, right? Yep. You see what it says there? It's Hold a on. color. It's a color computer. Micro. But it's a micro uh, color computer. It's a, it's a, a fraction of a color computer. It's, it's a color computer, though. Sorry. My Timex is a color computer. It's just black and white. <laughs> oh, we we see it in color. There were some nice shades of gray, I think, too. You know, my color computers always ran on black and white TVs, though. So what were they? <laughs> Monochromatic. Faux color. Shades of gray computer. Uh, Retro Innovation says someone should create a nice terminal app for the MC10 so you have a set of MC10s as terminals for the color I, computer. <laughs> I, have, I have such an app. I have it. I taped it. Got it on tape. Yeah. I have, I have one of those terminal. controllers. I have one of those controllers with the rotary dial and all the inputs in the back. Are they all DINs? Yeah. Wow. I, if anyone has a modem and wants to test it, I'll send it to them because if you load it up on an, the MC10 emulator without a modem hooked up, it just hangs. It needs something attached to the serial port to pull, and then right. it will hopefully come to life. Yeah. Well, that's one of the uh, news the news items, and, and maybe we'll do a, a full-on tech segment on this maybe in a future episode, but how do you get your cocoa on the Internet is a question that came up on the news that we'll, yep. that we'll get to. Um, after this host discussion is done. But yeah, so the topic was, and, and, and the, again, the group that this came up on, and, and I'm really looking forward to meeting some of these guys and hearing some of their stories, but this is a group that's called um, Vintage Gaming and Operating Systems. It's a Facebook group. It's got uh, nearly 3,000 members, so a pretty, pretty big group, and, and I've been recently invited to this group, and uh, Jeff Wood, is, I think, is kind of new to some of our Coco groups. He's one of the admins of the group. So hopefully we can get some of those guys and some of the members on the on the on a show or maybe a future retro talk and stuff because it seems like there's a lot of people in there with a lot of systems and stuff. Um, so there are certain people who are purists. There are purists that say if you're going to be retro, you know, you got to have, you know, so if if I was a Coco Three purist, then I, I would be all about well, I've got to have the real Coco Three. I've got to have CM8 monitor. I've got to have, you know, Tandy multi pack FD501. With the floppies and maybe a drive wire cable and i don't know drive wire wasn't even a tandy product right drive wire itself is aftermarket right so yes if nothing else i'd have to have a real hard drive running os9 and how bad would that suck right so yeah so even drive wire is not is not a purist solution a five um, meg hard drive with the hard drive controller hooked up to the yeah little yeah this, now we're getting into david ladd period. territory here yeah this so, period yeah well, yeah, you need a Birkin Park controller. Yeah, so I am not that much of a purist. And for myself, I would never be judgmental against another person who was into the hobby, right? So if um, 
if somebody says, hey, man, I like vintage systems, but they're not going to invest hundreds and thousands of dollars to own every single one of them, does that mean that their um, passion for, you know, the 80s and 8-bit, does that mean their passion is any less? And maybe they're maybe they're the smart ones who didn't go down the crazy freaking road that I did by buying 40 Cocos and having a room full of crap that my wife can't stand, you know? Um I used to have a 66 and a 67 charger. They don't make emulators for those. <laughs> I wish I wouldn't have got rid of mine. Yeah, yeah. And I envy the guys that have had theirs for 40 years. Well, you could get a driving simulator, I suppose, but it's not the same. No. No, it's not the same. No, and then storing them is another problem. Uh, James Diffendaffer says he had a 74 charger. Yeah. Yeah, so the problem with real hardware is that well, they take up space. The computers take up space. If you have the CRT yep. monitors, those things take up a lot of space. They're heavy. They're bulky. They take up a lot of real estate. They consume a lot of power. They generate a lot of heat. Um, and uh, I think some people might just say, listen, I, I like the Coco, but I'm not going to spend $300 on a real Coco 3. I like it. But I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not. It's not. I don't like it. Three hundred dollars worth, right? So um, maybe I'll get a cocoa pie. Maybe I'll just run VCC. You know, um, I don't think it's. I don't think that's wrong. Um, we have and now. Here's the other part of this too. Let's say you have the real hardware. Okay, I've got a cocoa. Are you gonna own every freaking cartridge? Because that's insane, right? There's hundreds of cartridges, that's and those things sure. go from twenty to forty dollars a piece. That's where something like the cocoa flash and the cocoa MC, uh, cocoa SDC come into play. Yep. Um, where I got a real cocoa, I have the real hardware, but God forbid, I can't afford to buy every cartridge. I don't have the room for them. Um, you know, I'm not going to be able to afford every floppy disk and every cassette tape ever made. Yeah, M James says it's not practical. So it's an interesting question, right? So I think I think most of us in the cocoa community, uh, as a whole, we're not that judgmental, right? I don't know how some of all the other retro communities are and and other systems. So this was on a and a, and a group that covers a variety of systems, and maybe some people's opinions are stronger than others on the fact. But I think most of us here, we're kind of okay with, uh, as John Linville would say, whatever scratches your itch, right? Hmm. All right. Uh, any more thoughts on this one, or have we beat this one to death? Uh, it's bleeding. It's bleeding? All right, and we have David Ladd. I don't know where David Ladd went. David, are you there? Testes, one, two, David Ladd. All right. Well, we got news coming up, boys and girls. So we'll take another quick break and we'll be back for some Coco news. So don't go anywhere. All right. Hello, this is Grant Leedy with Coco Talk. Got your Coco 3 yet? Hi, this is the award winning Alan Huffman of Subbeat the Software, and you're watching Stevie Fall Off Cliffs. <laughs> Have you got your Coco 3 yet? Hi, this is Rick Adams, author of Temple of Rom and Shanghai, and you've tuned into Coco Talk, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. What's going on, everybody? Original Gamer Stevie Stroh here, and if you're a fan of vintage computing and retro gaming, then you're going to love our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. There you will find custom designs by Instagram artist Joel M. Adams. You can get I'm a Coconut, Coco Talk, and other cool video game images on a t-shirt, coffee mug, or mouse pack. So if you love retro, then head on over to the retro swag shop at 8bit256.com today. Tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stroh sent you. Radio Shack has a great gift idea for the whole family. Fast action TV games, and they're on sale. Get this six game model for $29.95, or the four game model for $21.95. With rising entertainment costs, that's a real bargain. You play hockey, tennis, squash, and more. Easy to hook up, and great family fun that lasts all year long. The sale price TV games. Only at Radio Shack, a Tandy company. All right, well, we are back, and we've been joined by a legendary video game designer, Mr. Rick Adams is with us. Hello, Rick, how are you? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Yes. So, uh, welcome to the program, Rick, and uh, I don't know if you wanted to chime in on our previous host discussion about, you know, 
What is your definition of retro? Oh, right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm ecumenical. <laughs> 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 well, my, my focus is mainly um, if I'm developing a game, I need to feel reassured that it's going to work on actual hardware. If I can get it to work on an emulator, that's nice, but it, it, it isn't really the proof of the pudding yet. Mm-hmm. So as long as I know for sure that it'll work correctly on real hardware, then I don't care if you're using an emulator or not. So that's just sort of my you know, focus on that. I wonder if we said the right thing when we were describing your dodecahedron or whatever the heck it was. <laughs> what that was, was it? correct. Was it? Okay. Yeah. Go decahedron, yeah. Where's the twelfth side? Um, it's flattened. Uh, right, so a dodecahedron is like a twelve-sided die. Mm-hmm. They use a Dungeons and Dragons analogy there, but all of the corners and all the points, those are the nodes, and those add up to twenty. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Yeah, I've, I've heard it described as like a soccer ball. But yeah. I think actually, actually a soccer ball isn't actually a dodecahedron. No, it's made of uh, pentagons. Well, so is a dodecahedron, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, maybe no. not. I don't know. Anyway, I don't care. I don't yeah. care about soccer. I just care <laughs> about my game because I'm selfish. Yes. Are you proud, <laughs> proud of your son? Yes, I am. Yes. Cool artwork. I, I didn't even know he was doing that. So, yeah, yeah, he, and he's very independent. I I never know when he does anything. So <laughs> yeah, 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 and I you know it's, it's one of these things where he does great work. I appreciate what he does. I don't give him any pressure. I just ask him for the favors, and when he's able to, he delivers them. And he's always given us pure gold, you know. Mm-hmm. So I love what he does. I like his style. Um, it's cool stuff. So um, these images will, will probably be the logos for some of the future talk shows and things like that. Oh, so James Jones says, if you're explaining this to a retro gamer, say the dodecahedron is like the map on Hunt the Wumpus. Yeah, and, that's exactly what it is, yeah. Yeah. So this is like a modern hacker techno version of Hunt the Wumpus in a sense? Sort of, yeah. But the Wumpus... There's some similarities. Yeah, the Wumpus is the entire system that we have got to take down the whole system. I've always been uh, fascinated by the shape of a dodecahedron and, you know, the caves and hunt the Wumpus. And, you know, I used to make models of a dodecahedron, you know, back when I had my first job as a computer administrator. So I've always been fascinated by that, so I had to include that. It's sort of a, you know, Wumpus net hack uh hackers D D, you know it's sort of a little bit of dungeons of daggerith mm-hmm. uh, so a little bit of everything yeah well i i've definitely enjoyed playing it i haven't played the latest version that's got the visual map i'm looking forward to playing that one there um right it should definitely have you got to figure out what all the what all the programs do yeah yeah i still call them potions <laughs> yep <laughs> so, exactly yeah the potions right so uh, but it's cool yeah it's a cool game. When are uh, we going to have, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, Coco hooked up to a, uh, oh, you know, like if you do the wrong thing, you get a little zap or something. <laughs> you know. <laughs> like a, <laughs> oh, electroshock oh, feedback. Yeah, a little 7,000 volt transformer hooked up to, <laughs> you know, to a relay on a little pack on the side of the computer. Um, Chad Cunnington is, is asking, how do we get true lowercase on the Coco in MAME? Um, if you want to do it on a Coco 2, you need to run the MAME machine that's called Coco 2B, as in Bravo. And then there's a handful of pokes that you have to invoke to turn on the lowercase in that uh, VDG. Um, in Coco 3, you could just type in mode 40, right? Or with 40 or with 80. Um, but yeah, so to get it in MAME, I'm assuming you're talking about a Coco 2 lowercase in MAME, and you have to make sure you're running Coco 2B, and then whatever the pokes were to turn it on on a real hardware should work for that too. Or run yeah. software. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he says, or like the video game from Never Say Never Again. Was that a James Bond movie or something? I don't know. Yeah, but Never yeah. Say Never. Yeah, James. Okay, it's a neat game. 
All right. Well, we got some uh, we got some news to cover here. So um, we got some things that have come up along the way that have made their way into the world of news. And so um, recently, some discussion. And by the way, since I never um, since I never finished watching the end of last week's show, I only listened to it. I think Curtis may have covered a few things, but I wanted to try to catch up on all the news that was in our. Um, Discord channel where we had posted a bunch of links. Hey, Balloon Lulu Gaming is back. Hello, Balloon Lulu Gaming. Um, so, um, so one of the things that had come up, it came up in the Facebook group, and I know Neil talked about this recently on uh, Neil Blanchard on the Coco Crew podcast. But there's a game called Gnome Quest for the Coco Three that circulated the Facebook, and I think that was one that um, had been written in the C Basic Three compiler. Uh, but the, this guy has made a, a bunch of games, and his name is Mike Snyder. And he made a bunch of games for T&D Software. And he's got a pretty cool website where you can get most of these games. that they, they have been released to the public domain. And so that website is called CocoQuest.com. There will be a link in the description of this video. So I know that has come up uh, recently in the past couple of weeks on uh, both Facebook and on the Coco Crew podcast. So if you want to see a cool collection of Mike Snyder games, um, Check those out at Coco Quest. Ron, that was you who posted um, posted that Gnome Quest game, right, Ron? I think so. Yeah. Yes, did you play yes. it? It was me. Yes, I did. And what's Played it like? Because I, I saw the picture. I haven't it's tried it yet. Fast, to me, it looked fast acting back and forth, explosions, brightness. Yeah. yeah. Neat. It. Neat. It looked a little bit like Cubert. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so yeah, so if you're interested in Gnome Quest and some other cool games that were available through T&D Software, this is one of those subscription um, cassette services, right? So um, check out CocoQuest.com for the Mike Snyder collection of software. That's kind of cool. Now, this, this topic has been floating around for a while, and I know the Coco crew mentioned it recently, too, and I think we've mentioned it a few times on, on the show. But there's a, there's a project that's called the um, Arcade Game Designer. And this is a project that I think originated on some Acorn Atom systems or possibly a BBC system. I'm not exactly sure. So um, the topic has come up a few times, and I believe there is project being made to port this to the Dragon and the Coco. Because I think one of the systems it ran on used the VDG, the same VDG as the Coco. So I think the idea here is it's a tool set where you can not only make a new arcade game that you could then publish to multiple platforms... But there's also an existing library of games developed under this system. So if we ever get this finished, there should be a whole new library of Coco and Dragon games that we should just be able to, to, you know, compile and run and have access to. So that's kind of a cool thing. So this is on the um, the World of Dragon .org, um, archive. That World of Dragon .org. This is their forum. So check that out. There's a link in the description of that. Has anybody seen this system working on any other systems? No, nope. how's that sandwich, Ron? Is it good? Did you bring enough for everybody? Yes. <laughs> so this will be kind of a cool idea, and this reminds me of what Evan Wright is doing. Um, oh, yeah. So James Diffendaffer is saying the arcade game designer has a bunch of stuff on the spectrum. Okay, that's kind of cool. So you know, Evan Wright's doing this cross compiler thing where you can make an adventure game, a text adventure game, to run on on many systems. Kind of reminds me of that. Um, now, I, I believe Curtis did cover this one, but we'll go ahead and talk about it again. So this is Stuart Orchard, and he has made, uh, he is working on a, a game for the Coco called Return of the Beast. And I believe uh, Coco Crew covered this recently too. So I believe he's picking it back up again. So as of August 2018, Stuart is working on this. I think we looked at this live one time too. It kind of looks like Xevious where you're flying above the ground, but you can actually rotate in 360 degrees and rotate your ship and fire at stuff. But it was a very cool, very visually stunning game for the Dragon and Coco using the four-color um, uh, kind of green, yellow, blue mode of the Coco, like the P-Mode 3 type looking mode. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, oh, Rob Inman's asking, is there an update on Downland 2? We'd have to check on um, Paul Thayer's blog for that. Um, something else that came up, and I don't know if Curtis covered these two, but there was the topic of converting uh, a Cocoa to a Dragon or a Dragon to a Cocoa. So there was a couple links here, 
And these are not necessarily new projects. These are things that have happened for quite some time. But one of these gets into the keyboard uh, matrix, I guess, or keyboard connector. And so there's a couple of, um, I guess, projects or blog posts that, that cover that. Now, does did, did Curtis talk about this last week? Do you guys remember? No? A lot of shaking heads there? A lot of muted microphones? Okay. So I know this had came up. And um, I know when people talk about, well, what would be a cool hardware project? Well, one of, the, one of those was suggested, um, you know, how about how can we make a cocoa like a dragon or vice versa? And Curtis is saying, no, he did not cover the hardware stuff. So I, I, without, I know it was suggested, but I don't remember all of the context. So maybe I'm just posting this up here and for no good reason. But anyways, it's here. There's a couple of links to it. So if you're interested in the differences between the Cocoa and the Dragon, there's some links in the description here to these blogs. Um, handful of things have been coming up on Facebook. One of them, our very own Ron Delvo, was showing off how do you connect a Cocoa to a bulletin board system. And Ron, can you explain this to us? I know you're eating a sandwich. Do you need a minute? <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> Got the first one down. It's gone. Okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> what we have is a um where did it go here i have a usb to now i grab this thing here okay you see what that is yeah it looks like a usb serial adapter with a 9 yeah. db9 connector on it or whatever well you don't use that Okay. <laughs> what, you use, <laughs> what you use is this. Okay, that's a 25-pin one. Yes. Okay, 25-pin serial that's plugged into what, RS-232 pack? That is correct. Okay, and, and is, that's going to the other end of what? And that goes to my um, USB. Here. USB to USB to serial adapter? Yeah, to a uh, Windows PC. Okay, and then what's happening on the Windows PC? On the Windows PC, I have a program called S-Term, and uh, this is what it looks like, that little one. Right mm -hmm. there. And basically, this allows your uh, serial ports to uh, be used by the uh, uh, serial to USB connector. And so I'm on COM7. Bridge, basically a bridge Ethernet to serial. Yeah, exactly. I'm on COM7, and um, it hooks up to uh, the Coco. I have Twilight Term on. Mm -hmm. Which is Sockmaster's terminal program, right? Right. And uh, let's see if I have the, I have the uh, COM set incorrectly. I have to set it to 19.2, I think. There. You see it? I see it, yeah. I see it. Okay, so I'm gonna hit uh, now. Like <clears throat> yeah, I could I could actually type in here on the Coco. Oh, let's see, I have a shaky finger. That's I could what she type, said. I could type in on the Coco, <laughs> or I can go to this program here, and it says Internet, and I just type in um, the uh, name of uh, the VBS, and uh, that would be right here. It's. Does anyone know the name of the BBS? I don't have it. It's uh, what the uh, the 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 uh, Neil Blanchard one. Yes. What's it called? Um, I can't remember it. Anyway, so I won't be able to go on. But basically, this is how you launch it. Internal affairs. Yes. Okay. Here. Uh, yeah. oh. A L A. S dot com. Oh. Internal affairs. BBS.com. And where are you typing that into on your PC or on the Coco? Yes, on the PC here. Okay. So you're telling the PC where to go via Telnet, I assess? Yep. At 20, uh, port 23, protocol Telnet. I hit connect IP. And then <clears throat> we're loaded into the... Uh, Oh, wow. And there it is. There Internal it is. affairs. That is pretty cool. Yeah. So, so what you're running right now is basically as, as, um, as, um, Mark Overhoser was saying, it's a serial to Telnet bridge. Right. And that program called S term you're running on a windows PC is acting as that bridge. 
and you're connecting to a serial port on that computer. Now that computer could have either a physical serial port if it had the you know DB9 connected in the, in the back. If not, you can do a USB adapter. Um, and so this is one way if you've already got a computer that does it. Now there's other ways that like David Ladd could tell us with these ESP modules and stuff where you could do these serial bridges and stuff too. Um, but this is a quick and easy way just using a PC as kind of your serial gateway. There's some hardware boxes too, like I have these are called the Landtronics box. Okay. A 10, this is a 10 megabit to serial, basically we got Ethernet connector. Ah, uh, so you would plug it into your LAN. Yep. And then, okay. Uh, the one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't do name resolving. So you'll, so have, it doesn't... To up, you'll have to look up the, uh, the name of the address and then get the dotted decimal IP address. I see. So it doesn't have any DNS client, so you couldn't type in eternalaffairsvbs.com. You'd have to kind of like right. ping it, see what its IP address yep. is. and then. So what yep. you do is like type in ATDT space in the IP address? Yep, that's what you do. And in that, bo in that box, do you set the baud rate to match whatever your system is? Yeah, actually, these are set to 96 right now, but you can. there's actually interactive mode where when it first boosts up, you send it a bunch of Xs, and it'll go into configuration mode, and then you can change the baud rate and stuff. You can okay. also change through a telnet connection to it from the network side as well. Okay. So there, there, there are some little magic boxes that you could then... So at the end of the day, though, we need to start by plugging in a serial cable to our Coco. And right. we either plug that into the BitBanger port, which is the direct serial port, or if you've got an RS-232 pack, or if you've got one of the modern systems like what Jim Brain is making or what Ed Snyder's <laughs> making too. But you need a physical serial connection on your Coco. And then that's got to plug into something else that is able to resolve serial to IP for us. Yep. And it's either a magic box or it's a PC doing the work. Yep. I have this S term program on my um, Ron's garage in the file section, and it's in, in there as a text file, but it's mm -hmm. not. A, a, I couldn't upload it unless it was some other extension. So you have to change it back to an EXE file and then right. it'll run on a PC. Usually, it doesn't. I don't think it works on Windows 10. It's Windows 7 and back. Okay. So I mean, hopefully that that's answered the question to to a point. But maybe at some point in time we could do like a little expose video that covers multiple ways to get your cocoa on the internet and show some hardware solutions, some software solutions. But all of them are going to require you plugging a serial cable into the cocoa. The, the question just becomes what goes on the other end of that ca uh, that, that cable. Um, now, another option would be the Python DriveWire server that Mikey has made. Yep. I mean, if you have that running somewhere, that would let um, RS-DOS terminal programs connect to Telnet-based BBSs as well. And I believe, and, and now, and again, I think the question is how do we get a real Coco doing this? If you're running the Coco Pi, it's a little bit easier, right? Because Coco Pi would have a built-in drive wire server running on it or the Pi wire server. So there's a few ways we could do it in the Coco Pi, but that's not a real Coco. Um, what, what are you getting there, Ron? You're doing uh, www. some type of graphics? I'm, I'm pinging. I'm pinging my uh, internet. Uh, what do you call it? My um, website where, oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Ron broke the yeah. internet. <laughs> okay, so from your Coco, you're pinging a domain name and yes, you're getting exactly. back some responses. Yes, that's what I'm doing. Yep. Ah, so and I'll do it 20 or how many times? It says on there how many times it does it, and then it does an average of um, uh, so this is using you know, what, what the rates were. Yeah, using S term. Basically pinging through S term. Mm -hmm. Okay. 27 milliseconds. Now, what about uh, using a DC modem is what Nick Marotta is asking. <laughs> can, can you, uh, th that I don't have that... a real phone line. so Yeah. There's my uh, well, results. Even if you did, you'd have to have another modem at the other end in order to connect you. Yeah. Yeah. But if they did, you, know, you could do that as well. Yeah. I wonder if there's a place you can go to that would do a telephone line. You know, like a, I guess not. You know, you can get a carrier. Yeah, well, there was, uh, they had talked about this on a Coco Crew. There was like a phone line simulator, some little magic box that would give you the dial tone that became kind of like a null modem bridge 
for more than one system that only had a modem. Like if you didn't have a null modem cable and you had real modems, there was some type of box that you could connect two computers to that became like your dial tone simulator. Right, and the line voltage showed the modem was happy. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. Thanks for showing us that, Ronnie. Okay. Yep. And uh, also, what, what what other software other than S Term can you use? I don't um, know of any other myself. There's uh, one called TCP um, TCP Link. What is it called? I have Jim Brain actually wrote the original one. T TCP Sir S E R, <clears throat> and so it uh, runs on Windows and I think uh, Linux. It'll let you uh, basically build a TCP serial bridge. And right. Then too. So. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we just need to uh, make it easy for people to uh, connect without yeah. delving into the um, the um, all that intricacy. Yeah, that's right. The Alan Ladd uh, territory. Yeah, David, David Ladd. Ladd. So yeah, David Ladd. Right? Um, well, here, here is our very own Curtis Boyle. Pray, praise the Lord. We got Curtis in church here. This was Ron Del O. Putting Curtis's picture up. On, how big is that screen there, Ron? And and, and notice there's no one in the audience, so that <laughs> everyone out. He cleared they, them out, right? It's a church thing, you said. So they saw they saw the devil, did they? <laughs> Demon seed. Demon seed. Armageddon has arrived. <laughs> it's ten feet by eighteen feet long. Oh yeah, my that'll God. do the job. <laughs> that's that's neat though. And that's using the high color routine that Sopmaster wrote right. to take a BMP file and put it on a cocoa. Right. So that's Curtis on a cocoa on an eighteen foot screen. Yep. Now is this is this considered to still be retro or is this no longer retro? <laughs> it's a TV set. It's a t yeah. It's still a TV. <laughs> and Rob Eamon says, worst Cocoa Fest ever. No people. <laughs> <laughs> That's neat. You've shown us some pictures before. Yeah, you've shown us some pictures before of you getting your Cocoa up on that big screen. Was that a Cocoa Pie you used for that? Yes, because... Uh, the HDMI? It, it's HDMI, yeah. And yeah. I, if I had a... Um, uh, kangaroo, what do you call it? <laughs> the boomer? Oh, the switcheroo? Yeah, I could use the switcheroo with the actual hardware, but I don't have one. So. All right. All right. I'm limited to either um, highly advanced high tech stuff like the mm -hmm. uh, Cocoa Pie or the, um, you know, retro. Yeah. Well, you guys tell me if you want to see this whole segment. I think this is worth watching. Ron Delvo also posted this. Recently this week in Facebook. Ron's a busy beaver when it comes to keeping <laughs> us all up to date on what's going on in retro on Facebook. But this is the Computer Chronicles. What's his name? Stuart Schiffey. Is that his name? Yep. And he's supposedly the keynote speaker that's going to be at Tandy Assembly this year. And this um, this video has circulated. Uh, it's, we, you know, we've all seen it at one time or another. Uh, oh, Curtis Boyle is saying, uh, Nick Morentes, he wants to have you have the first massively multiplayer serial-based game. <laughs> Gun Gunstar is going to become a multiplayer death match. <laughs> yes, yes, bring it on. So, so th this is kind of interesting. That I don't remember when this was exactly posted. When this episode posted, but they were it, talk. It was about nineteen eighty nine, nineteen ninety. Okay, so so even then, they were saying the color computer is out of production, but they show a color computer users group in California. So do you guys want to see it? You want to see the clip? Yeah. or Yeah, is it worth playing on the show? Yes. Okay. Yeah, please. Here we go. New product from Tandy and their new company, Grid. Now, if there is any dedicated group of old computer users, it is certainly the people who still love their Coco, the Tandy color computer. We start with a visit to the color computer users group, in Santa Clara, California. Though the Radio Shack color computer is no longer rolling off the assembly lines, there are still plenty of happy Coco users. Nicknamed Coco by its fans, the color computer has been the entry-level computer for over a million computer users and programmers. And despite its age, it was first introduced in 1980, it's still being Fast. used by many diehards. The keys to continuing that success, the success is the affection that it has. Does anybody know this guy here, Mark Paulson? And I wonder if he's still around. No. Nope. 
I wonder if he's on the mailing list or anything else. Not with glasses like that. <laughs> oh, um, Kurt, Curtis Boyle says that's an earlier patch version by Kent Myers of G Shell. Okay, this I believe th that's what we used to call birth control glasses. <laughs> birth control <laughs> glasses. <laughs> yeah, my, my he, is he brains from the Thunderbirds. <laughs> I, I, I would feel bad if he's watching the show. Yeah, hey, <laughs> he's 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 a celebrity. Now, I'd be curious to know if he's still around. It'd be great to reach out to him. I wonder if I'm, I wonder if he's still aware that you know Coco enthusiasm still exists. You know? Oh, I don't know about well, after. He's not going to have anything to do with it now. <laughs> uh, we just got we just got raided by Jason Reichert. What was that, Jason? I said I don't know if he'll come on after you've made fun of his glasses. Yeah. <laughs> I made fun of his glasses, not of him. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was a different time. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so, come on. We it's love probably him. cool back then. He was there. We weren't. Yeah. Yeah. He got interviewed for a big time TV show on PBS. So R roll it. Roll it. Okay. We're rolling. In the minds of the u users, this was often people's first computer, a computer that they could learn with that was inexpensive enough to experiment with. Your local Tandy store may no longer provide much support for the Coco user, but the color computer owners themselves still get together at user group meetings to develop new programs and solve old problems. The support one gets from joining a user's group uh, is that you meet other Coco users, exchange programs, uh, sh uh, show and tell, get help with programming and hardware problems, and exchange equipment. No one can do everything all themselves. Some people are good at hardware, others at programming, and others at putting it all together. In addition to thriving users Rainbow. all over the country, the Coco still has its own magazine called Rainbow. The color computer operates under OS 9, an operating system which provided Coco owners with multitasking long before MultiFinder or Windows ever came out. In addition to its multitasking capability, faithful users have an endless list of reasons why they still use their Coco. This computer is a computer that can be afforded by any television viewer that assumes that they have electric power and television set. Uh, I chose the Coco also because of its excellent programming environment, because it is well understood, because it's a modular system, and because there's some excellent software, though some of it has to be purchased mail order. Mail order, since very few computer stores, even Tandy stores, sell Arkanoid. software for an orphan computer. But Mark Paulson says in the end, every PC becomes an orphan. We are part of a dying breed living in the twilight of the Coco. But so too is anyone else who owns a computer because the life cycle of these products is very short. But through the loyalty and creativity of Coco users, the color computer, like the old Royal Portable Typewriter, will never die. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. Now, here's you can, a, you notice ahead. that. Um, uh, you can you can tell when someone's new to the community when they say co 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 like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here's the funny part of this show. So Computer Chronicles came out in the '80s, right? So when you look at the introduction to their show, the production value is pretty much on par with our show 30 years later. So <laughs> watch this. Here. The Model 100 from the color computer now, sadly, there's no more Radio Shack shows like this. Computer Chronicles. Here we go. Check out their intro. That was actually their second generation opening. Their first one was uh, a lot more uh, cheesier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, they don't have D. Bruce Moore or Alan Huffman. That's yeah. right. We don't have... Uh, they don't have guys going, I, I, I. <laughs> <laughs> They don't have people that drop their cameras while they're showing how their computer works. Yeah, right? <laughs> Do we need to have a disclaimer before that if you have motion yeah. sickness if, yeah. for Ron? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Things may drop. Yeah. We may have a problem. So an another cool video that came up this week, too, was a guy named Scott Sabo. 
and he's in the Coco group as well, but he posted this in the TI-99 group. But he, you know, he's got Donkey Kong running on dozens of different systems here. One of them is obviously the Coco 3, but he's got some Atari 8-bit, some Texas and TI systems. But when you look at this video, what you look at is just a spit ton of Donkey Kongs all in one room. <laughs> Music to your ears, right? Look, that green screen's got to be the Apple too. So I thought that was kind of cool, just seeing all the different versions of Donkey Kong there. I think he posted that in our um, in our Facebook group too. Um, your electric bill just came. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Ken says he's the true king of Kong. Um, oh, oh, so William Carlin says that looks like that was done on an Amiga with a video toaster. That was a popular way to do video editing in its time, right? Before, you know, you could do it on just about any system. Uh, now, our good friend Ed Snyder, as if people were not already drooling over the Mega MPI with four slots and two serial ports and a sound chip. Now, Ed's looking at designing a new Coco 3 mechanical keyboard. So we're seeing the kind of first uh, teases of this design. And, um, you know, uh, there's been some talk about Coco keyboards. And we know Mark Marlette from Cloud9 is working on one to replace the membranes with switches. But that still requires you to have, you know, your keys and stuff. I'm not sure what Ed's cooking here. If he's going to have the, the 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 switches and the keys are what the deal is but we're seeing the peaks of a peak at something new right so what do you guys think of ed's latest design here come right. on ed's ed ed's a cylon ed i'm telling you ed's a cylon well he's got a picture of a cylon right here on his board See, it, there there it is it proves it he's a cylon. coco mech <laughs> So it says here, Coco one two three mechanical keyboard at thezipsterzone.com. So how many function keys? Well, here we go. Function one, two. function two. Good Left, call. right, up, down. You can see him. He's got everything kind of stenciled here. What the keys are. This looks like a a clone of the Coco three keyboard. Not that that's a bad thing, right? So well, with mechanical key switches. Yeah, you're just supposed to replace that board with the back of yours, right? No, no, no. I think his is a drop-in replacement. Yeah, because he's including keys, the whole works. Wow. Mm. And gonna, from we... from the switches that Ed is using, because I did a search for him, they look to be keys that, like, if if heaven forbid you manage to hit three million key presses, um, yeah, you can easily replace the 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 switch because they're all through hole. So, which but is, is the I'm break thinking. key red? Hmm. I don't know. That's an edge That's important. That's important. You know, the, you got to have the red key. Plus, is it going to be lit at night? Rattle hmm. can, not very expensive. You can get it in red. Yeah, you can get some Krylon spray paint. Uh, I'm hearing feature creep. <laughs> <laughs> Backlight? Oh, so James Diffendaffer says you can order custom keycaps. And James says that's the kind of replacement keyboard I'd like. And yeah. ja James Jones is asking, will it be possible to type in brackets and backslashes and underscores with some control FOO combinations or something, control fooey combinations? Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, the keyboard layout should be identical and the keycaps... Yeah. Assuming if Ed's going to use a laser etcher, they'll be the same keys in the same places with the same Coco map. So you shouldn't have to have anything that's different. This would all resolve if he would just put his butt on the show. Yeah, right? Come on. He's got to keep that air of mystery about him. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, it looks good. So like like anything else, Ed Snyder will drop a picture on Facebook and it gets the whole world drooling over what's next, right? So, Ed um, Snyder, Cylon of Mystery. Cy International Cylon of Mystery. Now, would this be <laughs> retro? Is this re Well, mechanical yeah. keys sounds retro to me, right? 
Well, it's going into a, a real cocoa, extending the life of a, an existing cocoa. Yeah, we had the discussion earlier, though, about pure, you know, that you need to be pure to be retro. And I think it's it going to be harder and harder to be completely pure without modern add-ons, you know. So well, 20, 20 years. retro is buying an HJL keyboard on eBay and dropping it into your existing Coca. Yeah, that are good keyboards. So 20 years from now, we're going to have new plastic cases, new keyboards, new motherboards. Yeah, so yeah. It'll be like one in 30 people will have the original. All right. Well, I mean, it'll look be, at. It'll be like George Washington's axe, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we replaced the, the head 20 years ago, and we replaced the handle uh, 60 years ago, but it's still George Washington's axe. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's Grant Leedy. Hey, what's up, guys? What's going I'm doing on? a uh, doing a Coco Man thing today. I'm driving <laughs> while on Coco Talk. Lunch break. <laughs> well, the viewership just went down. We were at like 28, 29 viewers. It just went down to four because Grant's on the show. So. You, you sold my bit. Are you sure it's not the other way, Stevie? Because usually it goes up whenever I'm on. <laughs> well, we, well, yeah, it's all, of, it's all of his it. Russian bots that he has that he pays. <laughs> Do I sound like collusion here? Is that what we hear? Hey, James Diffendaffer is asking you to hit a couple cars. <laughs> I can't do that. I can't do that right now. I got a police officer right here over on my uh, left. So Woo! hey. Police chase, police chase, let's do it. <laughs> High speed chase. It's great for ratings. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but I don't want the tickets. <laughs> is your tank full? Uh, actually, yeah, it is. We, we'll go a long time on a chase. <laughs> <laughs> they will catch him. He's on a mission for Gad. Yeah. I'm on a mission from Gad, yeah. He's got a pack of cigarettes. Is he in a white Bronco? No, no, no. <laughs> Good question. Good stuff. Good stuff. So, yeah, how many people would buy an Ed Snyder keyboard today if it was available? Yo. I would. Me, 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 me. Yeah. What yeah, do you... Sure, what, why not? I'd buy a couple. <laughs> Rob Inman says that Grant Leedy's the Demolition Derby program pack live action <laughs> version. <so. laughs> Pretty soon you'll be able to buy an Ed Snyder uh, computer with yeah so what keyboard. do you what do you think the That's sweet spot the is what would that keyboard sell for and what's you know i know i know there's going to be what it actually costs there's you know the cost of the parts and the keys and all that stuff but what do you think is a sweet spot on retail price for something like this 150 bucks or 49.95 uh, he's 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 looking at target price about 120 i think a sweet spot like fire sale type i gotta get it be 99 but 120 is actually a good price. Yeah. yeah I'll buy it. I'll get the to together um, myself, evil. save him the time. Hmm. Sell me oh. the board and all the parts, and I'll put it and together myself. Might be an option. Yeah, could be. The kit. You, don't need, you don't need the F keys, do you? <laughs> you <laughs> right? Yeah. Really. Well, you want the Yeah, how about, how about let, let's do an a la carte version. I really don't want those two function keys, so what can you yeah. shave off the price there? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Perfect. Nickel and dime you there. So. And if, if I don't get the red brake key, so discount. Yeah. Yeah, yeah James Diffendaffer says $120 is not bad for a low volume model with custom keycaps. Yeah, because that's yeah, the thing. So it, you can buy any crappy USB keyboard now for $10, but that's mass produced, right? So all this stuff has to be really custom made. And, and we're talking about quality yeah, parts now, too, too, right? So we're talking about mechanical switches. Um, it's you know, also labor I, labor intensive. I mean, that's that's a lot of labor to put a keyboard together. Right. Um, like a, given the discussion we were having last night on Discord, I would think most of that 120 would be the labor because yeah. the parts themselves don't seem to be that much. Not as much as I thought they were last night. Yeah. Hand stuffing all of them though and soldering them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the laser, the laser, the laser etching. etching might cost a bit. That's all, of the top of the keycaps. Well, uh, Ed said he's got a laser etcher already. So. Oh, has he? All right. Well, so what doesn't at, What doesn't Ed have? Yeah. <laughs> so we're looking at an Ed special, you yeah. know, with the uh, 
the pack on the side and all the goodies and everything. Yeah, yeah. Pretty soon, pretty soon it's pretty soon it's no longer the Tandy color computer. It's the Ed Snyder color computer. <laughs> it's like got the Coco <laughs> SDC, the a, Mega a Pack, the keyboard. Uh, yeah. You know. Would we call it a Coco Stir? <laughs> the Zipster, the Zipster it Coco. It doesn't have the memory. Oh yeah, boomerang memory. There you go. There you so. Go. Uh -huh. <sighs> Um, what was it? oh so yeah I'm beginning to think that Ed's got like a replicator right he's got one of those Star Trek replicators at his house yeah, he, he's a Cylon I'm telling you yeah he's a Cylon and he has technology yeah. he knows how to use it he's he's building friends that's what he's doing no the, wonder he can get stuff done so quickly for so many projects that's kind of reminds right. me of Westworld yeah, <laughs> yeah T yeah, Earl Grey hot. Yeah, uh, Curtis Boyle says, I think Ed has replicated himself, which is why he can <laughs> do so much. Um, the last news item I have queued up might actually be another host discussion. So maybe we'll take a quick break and we'll come back, but I'll tease you with what it is. But another thing that came up in the news this week is kind of the shutdown on a big ROM emulator site. So the MU Paradise, EMU Paradise, you know. So I don't know if we want to talk about that and give our opinions on copyrights and what's fair and reasonable and stuff like that, especially since uh, there's at least one person here who's got copyrights of his own products, maybe here from a creator side as well. Um, so the last news item might even be a host discussion. So I will go ahead and run one more uh, commercial break, and then we'll be back and we'll talk about uh, the closing of Emu Paradise after these words. We will return. Hey, this is Eric, and you're listening to Coco Talk. Hi, I'm Mike Rowan, and you're watching the original gamer, Stevie Stroh. And when you're done watching, come over and listen to the Coco Crew podcast. Hi, this is John Linville. And Neil Blanchard. We are the Coco Crew. I hope you're enjoying watching Stevie Stroh play video games, especially the Coco games. And when you're done with that... Check out our podcast at CocoFood.org. Where can you catch all the latest news and information about the Tandy Color Computer and Compatibles? Oh yeah. I'm talking about the Coco Crew Podcast. Dig it each month. Join John. Mike as they lay down the latest news and information about the Radio Shack Tandy Color Computer and Compatibles. Move to interviews, tech segments, and discussions all about the Radio Shack Tandy Color Computer. Strut your fine self over to www.cococrew.org and start listening today. Coco Crew Podcast. Keeping it Coco Dig. Some people have big plans after school. You know what Elliot's gonna do? Jeff, too. Elliot's at work on a book report using Scripsit on Radio Shack's Color Computer 3. It hooks up to his TV. And Jeff's at his Radio Shack Color Computer 3 playing the newest football game. But wait, what's Elliot doing playing new Super Pitfall? And Jeff's having a blast with a new math tutor. You never know what you might try with more than 100 programs for fun and learning. Radio Shack's Color Computer 3 comes with everything you see here. Other items each sold separately. Only at Radio Shack. All right, we are back from break. And Grant Leedy's here, too, in the car. And I just want to say, Grant, you did a great job last week hosting the show, streaming the show, um, you know, running all the commercial breaks, doing all that kind of stuff. And all you guys, it was great to be a, a, a viewer for a day and to watch it from the other side of the screen, you know. <laughs> it was kind of neat. So I want to thank you guys for our, that. It was our pleasure. Yeah, man, pleasure was mine too. One more, one more news item that we just kind of came across here too. This is another friend of the community, but uh, John T. Robs is showing off his latest gaming PC playing NetHack, which is, uh, which basically I saw this. I go, dude, that looks like Rogue, <laughs> and doesn't it though? This looks a lot like the uh, Rogue type game here, 
And so James, uh, uh, John has got this high-end gaming PC running an old um, <laughs> MMO type game here. And I asked him about it. I said, it looks like Rogue. And he says it's a descendant of Rogue. It's probably the most popular uh, of the Rogue-like games. And he's been actually looking at porting it to um, to the Coco. Curtis Boyle says it's kind of a sequel to Rogue. But yeah, so this is, I guess, on a PC. And um, did these things become like what they call the MMOs, massive multiplayer online type games and stuff? Or was this still kind of single player? Does anybody know? Because I never played it. I never played Rogue either. I believe NetHack is multiplayer. That's multiplayer? That's why it's called Net. There you go. There, and, that, and that would make sense, right? Yeah, and so Curtis says the same thing too. He believes it was, um, he believes it was uh, multiplayer. So we're going to do another host discussion now, <laughs> and um, we're going to now talk about the um, the rise and fall of the website known as I don't know, if, not sure if it's supposed to be pronounced Mu Paradise or Emu Paradise or Emu or whatever, but it's a, basically it was a. It was a very famous ROM site. So for those who run emulators, and you know, you've, a lot of you are probably familiar with MAME, Multiple Arcade Machine Emulator, and downloading games like Donkey Kong and Pac-Man on, on MAME. Well, where do you get those ROMs? Well, there are websites that host them, and this was one of them. But this is one that's been around for 18 years, and it's now being told to shut down by the man somewhere. So... What do you guys think about this and the whole idea of ROMs and copyright and things like that? You're muted, Ron. Ron Delvo. Who was the driver of the, getting this thing shut down? Was there one particular company? Or? I, I believe uh, Magic 8-Ball says sources lead to Nintendo. Well, ah, uh, go figure. You know, uh, from what I can tell, Nintendo is pretty douchey. Um, and, uh, I don't know all the sources, but if I had to guess at one of them, yeah, James Diffendaffer says that too. So it's Nintendo, right? So, and the thing is, is that Nintendo is still around, right? And, and you know that Nintendo has released things like the NES classic and the SNES classic. And so they're still, they still own the copyrights and the, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And they're still making new systems on this. So this can potentially cut in to their revenue. Right. So 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 if anything, Nintendo, if they should just say, all right, well, we're going to pull down Nintendo. But for whatever reason, I guess they're going to possibly shut down the whole site. Um, I'm not real sure. But I, I think the topic here is, is how do we feel about ROMs? I think there's lots of um, there's there's lots of sides to this discussion, because one of it is um, historical preservation, you know, most people are not profiting from this, and for the most part, I don't believe m much money is taken out of too many people's hands, other than possibly Nintendo. Um, so, what do you guys think about the whole idea of ROMs and f copyright infringement versus historical preservation, et cetera, et cetera? Well, if the company's still around, if the company wants to preserve its own ROMs, right? Mm hmm. So, it, it doesn't feel that someone else should have to do that for them, maybe? Say and, that again. Uh, well, can you go to the dark web and get ROMs if you wanted to, or is there such a thing? Mm, possibly. I've never been on the dark web, so. Me neither. I only hear about <laughs> it. I don't know what it is or how you get there. You can get anything on the dark web. Anything, so. Yeah. Including yeah. a new Coco 3 keyboard? Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> it just cost you a kidney. Yeah. Oh, great. I have two. Yeah. So Curtis Boyle says they need to change it so copyright has to be renewed by the owner and it should lapse into the public domain if it's not. That way orphanware becomes public domain automatically, but the owners can keep the copyright if they choose. Um, hey, Bruce Moore has just joined us. Steve uh, Bjork has mentioned before about his copyrights. He goes after all his old stuff because uh -huh. if he let them lapse then that might invalidate his future copyright. Yeah, yeah. And there is something to be said if you do own a copyright that you if you don't defend it, you've basically given away the right to it. So sometimes you have to not only a particular copyright, but if you if you don't defend something that you wrote 20, 30 years ago, then someone can come after you about something you wrote a year ago and use that that's, use that against Steve, you. That's Steve Bjork's point of view. Yeah. 
stuff. Yeah. I think that was probably this that was probably uh right in the same realm of why the whole uh uh Barden books got pulled from the archive. I think that's probably a similar thing cuz I think he still writes books. Okay. So if he if he ignores copyrights on old material, he gives up copyrights to new material. He he risks, you know, he, he risks, risks that. A, yeah, he risks that that yeah. a, a court may find that, you know, well, he didn't defend this copyright from 30 years ago, so he has he can't defend a copyright from more recently. And that that's kind of screwy. That's that's we have very strange copyright laws and it it's 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 just um I mean, they, they keep extending copyright for Mickey Mouse. I mean, that, that's yeah. how it all got screwed up. Yeah. Curtis's point is good, though, because if you don't renew it, then it just lapses to the public domain, and then you know it's no longer your burden to carry anymore. Just let it go. Yeah. Yeah, it's so an interesting many, thing. So how many people now, once the website's um, down, how many people now are going to go out and buy a real, I don't know, uh, Pac-Man machine or whatever, so that can play Pac-Man now. Uh, or a Nintendo machine. Nah. Yeah, well, so I'm not. just wondering how much well, yeah. money they're actually going to gain, the Nintendo and all them, are actually going to gain by doing this. Well, Maybe the, the, the thing looking. is, it's the, it's the game ROMs themselves, and you know, they go onto the Nintendo systems, and I think what Nintendo is looking at is, okay, people have all these ROMs running on emulators and stuff, and they're coming out with these classic games, consoles with HDMI uh, in, uh, output. So they feel that, okay, uh, people already have this stuff running on uh, MAME and, and, and other emulators. They're not going to buy the consoles anymore, or the new ones. And yeah, so they're looking to protect their future. They're protecting their future. They're also protecting future copyrights. Uh, and, and it's been traditionally most of the Japanese market or the Japanese games, Sega is one of them. They, they viciously, uh, vigorously uh, protect their copyrights. So mm -hmm. this is not I, unusual. I, th I figure that, uh, you know, lawyers got a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. And, that, and that's the other thing, like the, uh, uh, I, I've, I think it's ASCAP or something like that for the music. Uh, they have a, a legal division that they just, that's what they get paid to do. And uh, they don't get, you know, it's the artists and the record companies that pay into those lawyers. And they just, that's their job is to go out and uh, find all this uh, websites that have all their material on there. Yeah. I mean, I'm in favor of respecting copyright. Um, it's one of the lessons I learned later on. You know, when I was a kid, did I get a lot of copied software for my Coco? Absolutely. That was one of the motivation, motivations for getting a computer. Because if I bought a cartridge-based system like an Atari, there's no way I would have had the software library I had. So when you're, when you're a dumb kid, you don't have any moral compass when it comes to accepting free software from your friends, not realizing, hey, man, that I'm screwing up the market. I'm possibly you know, going to make somebody never want to make a new game because he didn't get the sales he was hoping. You don't think about those things when you're when you're a kid, but when you grow up, hopefully you understand that. So I think most of us as as adults, you know, and, and I think those those decisions are based on your financial situation. I think a lot of kids now who want to play Minecraft and they can't afford the twenty six dollars themselves because they're ten years old or whatever, they're going to find a hacked copy of Minecraft to play it. And I understand it because I was that kid one day. Um, but when you're older and you've got the money, hopefully most of us as mature adults, we're not going to be just trying to scam the system to get free software because we're screwing somebody who's now doing it as a hobby or a small independent you know, production. Um, I believe these things should be preserved, though, too. I think like things like the color, because the question on the Coco group was, what would this, what's this going to mean for the color computer archive? And I think a lot of people came to the conclusion that we're kind of under the radar. You know, we don't have software made by Nintendo or bigger studios. So um, we're probably pretty safe. Well, the Zaxxon up there is Sega's property. Steve York's Zaxxon, I think, is up there. Right, right. But I think, you know, again, I think we're a small, obscure system that's very, fairly well under the radar. Well... One thing I wanted to contribute was the company that currently owns the Amiga IP, Colanto, they make available on the Google Play Store for an Android tablet 
or an Android phone, if you want to run one of the Amiga emulators for Android, a $2, it's not an app, it's just the, um, the ROMs for the Amiga, the Kickstart and the Workbench, so that you can boot up the emulator. Or if you go to their website, they have a $10 package that includes all of the ROMs and Workbenches in an image file. And they are not the encrypted ones that come with Amiga Forever. They're unencrypted. So you can use them with any of the Amiga emulators on any platform. So that's what I think companies should do is sell the ROMs for a reasonable price unless they're going to productize them and bring them out. You know, like even if, even if Nintendo sold every game an image for two bucks a piece, Mm-hmm. people would buy them and they get cash out of stuff that they've amortized a long time ago. Oh, yeah. If the barrier is really, really low, people will pay it. Yeah, yeah. You, you give up an espresso for the day. Yeah, and and a lot of these collections have been released, like the Atari Vault has been released many times, and there's many volumes of the Atari Vault that contains yeah, not know. only 2,600 so- titles, but arcade titles and things like that. I have purchased the Atari Vault more than once, I have per- purchased Sega Genesis collections more than once. Um, you know, uh, I don't mind paying for it because, at, you know, at that point, you know, you've, in, in a sense, you can kind of um, alleviate some of your guilt because we all know we've gotten a lot of stuff for free. And honestly, the fact that uh, MU Paradise is down now, the effect that has on my ROM collection is none <laughs> because I've already got them all, right? So I have every ROM for every 8-bit and 16-bit system ever made because I've downloaded them. For, I've been collecting ROMs and emulators for 18 years, you know? Um, well, so people on eBay selling SD cards loaded to the max. Yeah, and, that, and to me, that's a douche thing to do. That's a scumbag move because they don't own that, right? And that's the big thing about MAME. And MAME will not let you distribute MAME with ROMs. They don't want you doing that because they are not going to get involved in, in peddling you know, other people's software. But you can buy a preloaded SD card with RetroPie and all the games preloaded and just plug it in and go and not have yeah, to. Yeah, and you know, it, it, that's a slippery slope because what are you saying here? Are you, gonna, are you charging for your time to produce it or are you charging for the software? Well, and, they're about eight bucks, so I yeah. don't know. Yeah, okay, so at that point there, if you're just charging for the hardware and the service, that's one thing. But if you were trying to sell, and I've seen people sell this. I see it on Facebook all the time, these generic retro systems. It looks like a Nintendo, and it says it plays 500 games. And people are selling crap like that. That's 100% copyright. That's black and white. You're a copyright infringing scumbag, and you're selling a hacked retro emulator. And the fact you're selling it, you should burn in hell. And that's that's how I look at that. That's black and white. Um, yeah, you see now with um, uh, Colanto, who distributes some software with Amiga Forever, they licensed it. They got the rights. So whatever they give you with Amiga Forever is legal and licensed and paid for. So that's like a, that's the way it should Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have ROMs, but I'll still buy things. Like I say, I've bought a lot of Sega collections. I've bought a lot of Atari collections. Um, I have avoided buying an NES classic because I haven't seen the value in it for me. And I think, and, and here's where I think too, uh, an NES classic is catered to somebody we talked about earlier. Are you a purist in retro? Or are you an enthusiast in retro? I think something like the NES mini classic is for somebody who's really a, uh, I'm going to tip my toe in the retro hobby. Uh, this is cool because it's a turnkey plug and play device. I plug it in and I use it and boom, I'm done. Right. Uh, anybody who's a retro fanatic and a little bit of a, of a techno file, well, they can make it, they can run an emulator. They can download the, cause emulator is not plug and play, right? You got to know how to get the emulator. You got to know how to get the ROMs. It requires a slight degree of difficulty, but any tech head could do that. So for me, the fact that I've got the entire Nintendo collection on an emulator, I don't see the need to buy the NES Classic. Um, if they had sold an NES collection that I could play on my Xbox, like I have done for the Sega and for the Atari, I would spend 30 bucks on an NES collection because um, I believe the software is worth it. But to me, I don't think that box is worth it. You know, that's just my opinion. Um, but Nintendo, and listen, Nintendo is one of the few companies that's still current and still makes software. So they've been able to maintain it. And where the hell's Atari? Where's Sega? You know, where's Coleco? 
So uh, I respect their rights to want to protect their software. But I think it's, you know, there's a, there's a certain part, too, of let us preserve the systems, too. Let's not shut down ROM repositories that are, have a kind of a historical purpose, too, you know? So is this all 8-bit stuff that's being protected? I'm sure it's bigger than that. I'm sure if they're shutting down the site, we're talking about arcades, consoles, all kinds of stuff. Looks like Grant's in a high-speed pursuit there. <laughs> hey, Bruce, how are you? We haven't heard from you. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> You're still muted. <laughs> but back in the Atari ST days, there was a Macintosh emulator called the Magic Sack, and it required you to buy actual Macintosh ROMs. Uh-huh. The cartridge. It would not work with an EEPROM. It would only work with the actual Macintosh ROMs. And what you would get is you'd get 64K ROMs that people were upgrading to the 128K ROMs. And Apple caught on to that, and they stopped returning the 64K ROMs to the owners and stopped allowing the service centers to resell the ROMs. So then they came out with the 128K ROM version, um, and you could use the 128K ROMs, but you still had to buy that from a service center. So a lot of people were just taking them off of bad boards. And, and again, at least you were trying to preserve the license because the license was in the ROM chip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Bruce, how are you? I think I'm unmuted. You're unmuted, <laughs> you are. Yeah, how's yeah, yeah, how's yeah. it going, eh? We finally got a Canadian on the show this week. Finally. Oh really? We're we're not we're not representing too well this time. No, no. Curtis is uh, Curtis is too hot. Uh, Curtis it's is too hot. working. <laughs> yeah. It's actually too hot up here. Yeah. You know, with the cocoa, the copyrights are all over the place. Yeah. Candy was bought by AST and then bought by Samsung, the computer. So Samsung owns the Tandy IP for the cocoa, but Microsoft owns the basic. And Microware owns the Super Color Basic for the Coco 3, the editions. So if someone were to want to do a Coco clone, and obviously they would clone a Coco 3, if they were going to, and someone did contact Samsung to try to get a license to the Coco ROM, and Samsung was not interested in, in selling a license at all. They just weren't interested in doing the research and the work to. What is the process of putting stuff into public domain? I mean, what? Why can't we just have everything that's Radio Shack candy just in the public domain and be done with it? Well, a certain amount of time has to go by, and the company. I mean, I would guess the Coco ROMs are in the public domain by now because no one's defended the copyright. No, they're not. They are owned by AST. But I thought it, AST it, it, was bought by Samsung. Yeah, no, it was it was AST, and then it was bought out by Samsung. Yep, you're right. But uh... and again, someone contacted Samsung many years ago, and Samsung said they were not interested in licensing the IP, and they didn't think it was worth it, and they didn't think it was worth their time to go do the research in their our archives to verify that they owned the IP and that they could license it. Hmm. Where Bruce goes, Bruce still there? Him? I'm still here. Let's hear from Bruce. We haven't heard from you in a while. How you been, Bruce Moore? Uh, pretty good. I decided to uh, uh, get down to my audio station there and get another episode of Coco Forever cranked out. Woohoo! It's live now. I'm just about to send an email out, hopefully, if I can make it work, to to people and let them know. But episode six is up and is should be up and ready for download. And it has a... Um, uh, it's sort of like a mini adventure game that's integral to the story is how this episode opens up so you actually have to tell Chuck what to do should you go here or go there should you try this or try that and that's a significant part of the program oh neat yeah where, where a boot to download it say again I said where a boot to download it where a boot he's using Canadian a boot he's a boot to download it where a boot, <laughs> where a boot to download it eh? <laughs> I'm that's gonna 
That's an East Coast thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to wait for it to show up on one of these uh, MU Paradise or ROM Nation websites. Yeah, so I yeah, get yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm going to defend my copyright. <laughs> I could buy some straws while I'm at it, too. <laughs> I don't know, whichever. Where are you? CocoForever.Gracenote.ca. I've actually got a little uh, teaser I can play since you're here. How about we do that? Oh, okay. Imagine a different world. A world where Tandy Corporation has the upper hand. Where the cocoa surpassed all competitors. And all you have to do is travel back in time without making a single mistake. Coco forever. How does it feel? I'm still believing. You definitely earned this office. Yes, you're too kind, and thank you. You want to grab some food before we head back and look at that Alt Reality OS9 module? <laughs> It's only a 40 years past due, but yeah, sure. How does it feel? I'm still believing. Coco Forever. Grace Note. CA. Yeah, and uh, I'm pretty sure that, as, as a, I know some of you guys know, there's been a, there's a number of guest voices that appear in the show and uh i believe grant leedy and david ladd feature prominently in this episode Ooh, that's worth Woo-hoo! the price of admission right there yeah 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 i think you want to check it out hey it's david uh, Dave, and, and, and um Coco Man. so that must be the bad timeline then <laughs> we will have to track closely how that affects the download rate yeah hey david you still there <laughs> David, are you still with us? Please stay live wire. David Ladd. Is one, one of David Ladd's fans is in the uh, live chat asking if uh, Drencore is here. Balloon Lulu Gaming is asking for Drencore. That's David's alter ego. Um, you got fans everywhere, David. Oh, that's cool. So David and Grant will be on the latest one. So episode six is the new one, which is technically the seventh episode because you started on zero. Started on zero. It's a cocoa thing. Yeah. Oh, there's Rick Adams showing us the dodecahedron. Um, yeah, looking good. Looks like the dough part. <laughs> saw the dough. It looks like a stealth fighter. Right. Dough. All right. So how do? So go, sorry, Rick. Go ahead. Sure. What were you going to say? No. Go ahead. I'm you. 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 Okay. You first. So I, I've just taken out. You know. Let's see. What I'm. I'm at uh, fifty-five percent. So I've taken out a number of nodes. So I, I was just showing you that when you take out a node, it removes it from the diagram. Okay, so it takes out the line. Yep. Okay, that you have to get both sides of the node for that line to disappear, though. Oh no. Uh, when you take out a node, it's got three lines that go to it, mm-hmm. and those three lines disappear. Oh, all okay. All the connecting ones go away. Yeah. Because you can't go to that node anymore. Gotcha. Okay. Neat. So you have sort of a visual, you know. You can see your progress. Yeah, what's 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 left to do type thing. Mm-hmm. Neat, 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 neat. So, um, so in, in order to wrap up this whole ROM uh, discussion here, um, I, I just kind of wanted to see both. So, Rick, you, you're a guy who has had games that were sold right. commercially and stuff like that. Right. I, I respect your copyright and your intellectual properties and your labor. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and and you certainly should have a unique perspective on websites that host archives of of old software. Well, or, yeah, I'm gonna have a perspective that's just mine. Uh, you know, and it's not gonna be the same as Steve Bjork's. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the copyright on Temple of Rom belongs to me because it reverted back to me after two years from Tandy. Uh, so you guys have got Temple of Rom out there on a number of so- Cocoa sites. And, uh, you know, so technically that is a violation of my copyright. But when I found out about that, I find it very difficult to get exercised about that. Uh, Because, you know, let's face it, 
Uh, I have seen my last fourteen thousand dollar royalty check. Uh, that's not happening anymore. Uh, so even if I were to put my foot down, you know, I'm not going to get any money out of it. And I don't. It's really hard for me to care. It's like uh, back in the day, uh, I had a rattle trap car, and I sold Temple of Rom, and then I had a new car that all you guys helped buy. Who is eating something or? taking over the channel with eating their uh, uh, salad or something. Um, <laughs> it might be Grant's car noise, or I don't know, Jason's working on a workbench there. I'm not sure. Yeah. It sounds like Jason yeah. working. I was going to say, it better not be my car. No, so my, my, my car. microphone is muted uh, locally. Okay. So, right. anyway, uh, so, uh, you know, you all you guys bought me a car. I think we're good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, you guys, you know, back in the day, uh, you mowed lawns and you saved up your money and you bought Temple of Rom and then the royalty checks came in and then I took my rattle trap car, you know, and I gave it to somebody that needed a car, uh, you know, for free. And then we bought a new car. The only car we ever, the only new car we've ever bought, you know, and the only new car that we will ever buy, uh, cause we actually could afford to do that because all you guys helped me out. So, you know, I am not upset at all uh you know now i did bomb threat and it's like i've probably gotten you know a grand total of 200 dollars from bomb threat you know it's not really about the money anymore uh i don't really care about that because you know it's just this is just for fun at this point mm -hmm. not the fame so what oh not, not the fame all oh, the fame is okay but uh doesn't pay the bills <laughs> Yeah, that's true. It, it feeds the ego, but not the belly. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> so, well, um, well, what if and, you uploaded to each of the sites that hosts your software a, re a replacement version that has a text file that says, if you've enjoyed this software and you want to send me a buck, yeah, you know, do that. Here's my mailing address or here's my PayPal account and send me a buck if you've enjoyed the software and haven't paid for it. Right. Uh, well, I would rather do another version of Temple of Ram and then sell that. And again, I won't get much money for it. I'll get $200, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, the scene is much, much smaller than it used to be back in the day. Uh, and I'm okay with that. Yourself. What was that? You won't be suing yourself for copyright infringement. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's my copyright. So that was kind of the beautiful thing about that is that the copyright reverted to me after two years. Mm -hmm. But of course, that also meant that uh, they could still sell it after two years, and I wouldn't get any royalty checks after that. So it's sort of a two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. But, you know, from a legal perspective, you know, what I'm doing, you know, my attitude is suicide, because, like, well, I'm really pretty much giving up the, the, the copyright. But I just, I just don't care. I really enjoyed my really cool new car back in the day, and you guys uh -huh. did that all for me, and you know, so I think well, we're we're good. What did you get? Uh, I got a, a Nissan Altima station wagon, hmm. and it was really fancy, and it had a, a it was a talking car. If you were you know like if it was you you it would say things to you like fuel level is low, <laughs> left door is open. The door is and a jar. That one. The yes. Left not door a, is no, a jar. it's a door, not a jar. <laughs> came that was kind of a that was kind of a newfangled fad that yeah. lasted about 15 seconds because that talking car drove me bananas it's like oh gosh yeah it's kind of like the voice on a gps it's right it's, it's good for the first minute and a half and then you want to shoot it yeah <laughs> recalculating <laughs> recalculating Yes, well, yes, I don't know where I'm going. Shut up. Recalculating. Right. Well, th I mean, that's very that's very cool of you to be so gracious with your um, intellectual properties with the community. Mm -hmm. And in a but way... That's my choice. Yeah, and that's your choice, and, and I would imagine... And other people would choose other things, yeah. You imagine there is some sense of reward, hopefully, that you know that people are at least enjoying it, right? Because if somebody's mm -hmm. downloading it and playing it, then hopefully they're enjoying it, and maybe that's rewarding in another level. Oh, yeah. When somebody tells me... You know, oh yeah, Temple of Rom, that was my favorite game. I, you know, I mowed lawns all summer to get to buy that game. I'm like, okay, you just got me right in the fields, bro. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, not me. I used to rob banks. But. <laughs> you would not believe how many websites I had to go to before I could get the free download to your game. I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> no, there, you, there was, a, there was a, a utility that Rick had uh, released. It was uh, the UUCP uh, uh, for OS9. Yep. Right. Yeah. And, and I used that for a while because I was able to get my news uh, feed from Texas A&M. They, they were very impressed and astonished that it was done on an 8-bit computer like the Coco. Yeah. I was really proud of that. I never got any money from the, for, for, for that. <laughs> yeah, James Diffendiver says, it took me 10 minutes of Googling to find your ROM. <laughs> To find the hard. yeah, to find the ROM for Temple of ROM, no less. Yeah, irony. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, have also, we... all my software I, I deliberately made easy to. There was no pirate, uh, no uh, what do you call it? Uh, copy protection on it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Activision uh, told me to put copy protection on Shanghai, and I well, I wouldn't say that I refused. I just sort of never did anything about that because I would I would rather not have copy copy protection. Right. Uh, the reason being that uh, a lot of people wanted to be able to read off the ROM contents and put it on disk and run the programs from disk, and I wanted them to be able to do that easily. So that's why I made all the code position independent, and you know I, I tried to make it so that you didn't need to do anything at all to uh, copy it. Now that meant, you know, there, the, a lot of people, you know, pirated it. Yeah, that, that is mm -hmm. what that meant. But, but you know, I thought being able to uh, read it off and, and run it from disk is was a sensible thing for people want to want to do. So, well, what if you uh, got uh, somebody um, who made a clone of your games and, uh, and tried to make it better, and then sold it as their own? Um, did that ever happen in any Way. That never happened. Um, yeah, I, that would I would feel kind of salty about that if somebody tried yeah. to do that. Uh, a, a common practice uh, that Steve sort of uh, alluded to was if you had like a shareware thing, like I had a shareware uh, a terminal program, uh, you would have companies that would take all that shareware stuff uh, and all that guiltware stuff, and they would put it on a floppy, and then they would sell the floppy. And then mm -hmm. somebody says, well, I bought the floppy. I yeah. bought this thing. So... I don't need to send you 15 bucks, you know, because right, right, I right. bought it right. from these. Uh, that, that was, that's not really kosher. So, and a yeah. lot of people were pretty mad about that. I, I thought that was pretty scummy, but mm -hmm. uh, there's always, there's always scummy people doing things. Like that. Oh yeah. 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 Curtis Boyle is pointing out that he does have downloads on his site, but all the downloads on the Curtis Boyle games list website have been approved by the author that yep. they, they volunteered to let their things be, um, um, and so. I know that if if I asked Curtis to take it down, he, he would, would do it. Yeah, because he's an honorable yeah. guy. Yep. And I I am not asking him to do that. He, yeah. Please keep that up with my blessings. So yep. I'm I'm good. No, that's awesome. All right. So have we beat this discussion to death? I mean, we're, yep. the, we're taking down a ROM site. I believe a lot of us respect preserving copyrights and intellectual properties, but I don't know. I just think there's something to be said to keep old things alive and preserved too. So There's... I know now that if I need ROMs to contact you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So. All right. Uh, so that will probably conclude our host discussion. And uh, we could probably get close to wrap up the show here. Um, so we're going to, we're going to change the discussion here now to the closing ceremony. And uh, as we get ready to wrap up Coco Talk, is there anything that we missed? Anything that we didn't talk about? Uh, are you raising your hand there, Mark Overholzer? Yeah, um, yeah. NetHack actually is single player. It says. <clears throat> oh, okay. It was built on Hack, which was built on Rogue. Okay. Uh, single player, so I'm not sure why it's called NetHack. Anyway. Okay. Okay. That, that should keep the uh, you know detrimental fan mail down. So. All right. Well, we're, yeah, we're, we're pushing three hours, but another good show. Is Grant still with us? Grant dropped off. Okay. So Grant dropped off, but we did have Grant join us. So Curtis has been in the live chat. Let's, uh, let's look I at got, I got something to say. Have you noticed um, 
I posted in Ron's garage, a uh, guy has a game playing in the background against the wall on the back of the monitor has LED shooting um, that kind of coincide with whatever's being played on the monitor, which is kind of cool. And uh, then it, there was another um, LED TV that uh, blended into the wall. Uh, like when you're not, you don't have the TV on, the, it, it kind of looks like a uh, painting. <laughs> It's pretty cool. Uh, I'm I'm in Ron's garage right now. So yeah, we're scroll down. Okay, Samsung QLED HD yeah. TV. Yeah. Okay. So let yeah. me switch over to full screen. And then if you go down a little further. Okay, so we've got the one TV here that's got where the lights. It's got kind of like a backlight. Yeah, backlights. Like we were playing an adventure game, or well, or, uh, whatever they have up there is the anime. It looks like. Yeah, but uh, your back wall is um, spectacular. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of intelligent lighting based on what the scene has too, right? So yeah, it's kind of extending. Cool. Oh yeah, very cool. Yeah, that's neat. That is pretty neat. Yeah, I'm not sure what the show is that they're showing here. Yeah, no, not either. But it, it's um. Yeah, there was that's this is not a brand new feature. There was another TV that did that before too that would have some dynamic, you know, backlighting to it, but that is pretty cool. Yeah, I wasn't aware that they had such a thing. And then the, the one up here does uh looks like it makes a um a graphic for your wall when the TV is not on. It blends into your your wall. <laughs> okay, I'm having a hard time getting this one here to open. Yeah, I it I think it may just be a screenshot. Okay. So it blends That's into your wall, idea. so it kind of looks like a painting. Yeah. Yeah, like digital art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's yeah kind we of have those idea. at my work in some mm -hmm. of our conference rooms, and it looks like it's just a picture. Mm hmm And so, yeah, that what, what that's basically becoming is just one of those giant digital picture frames that's just, uh, you know, the size of now a, a big screen TV, right? Which I had actually heard that, you know, Bill Gates, you know, had, when he had his house of the future back even like in the 80s, he had things like that where he had digital art on giant custom displays back then where he had the artwork, but the artwork would change. Of course, when he did it, that was like revolutionary and it wasn't a consumer product. But now we've got digital picture frames that would just scroll through slideshows. And even your smart TVs, you could plug in a flash drive with images and it would run a slideshow for you on your TV now. But what's interesting with his is he did it on 640K. That's right, because nobody needed more than 640K <laughs> back right. then. So. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who would ever need more than 640K? <laughs> who are these people? Who are these people who need one mega memory? <laughs> That's a Seinfeld moment right there, right? So, um, OS Niners. OS Niners, right? So uh, we've had a lot of people in the live chat. We've had Nick Marotta, Nick Marotta, Nick Marotta. Retro Innovations has been here. Curtis Boyle, Chad Cunning, Cunnington, and Ken Reichard. Nick Marotta, Rob Inman has been here. James Jones has been here. James Diffendaffer has been here. Uh, uh, Nick Marotta has been here. And Retro Innovations. And Rick Adams is here. And James Jones and Mr. James Diffendaffer and Ken Reichard. And all kinds of people in the live chat. Uh, Sheldon McDonald uh, was here earlier. And uh, Grant Leedy was here. And James Jones. And Curtis Boyle. And lots of people. I'm scrolling through the live chat here. Uh, Retro Innovations. Rick Adams. James Diffendaffer. Coco Man is here. And who else? Ken. Ken Make It. And all kinds of people here. Balloon Lulu Gaming has been here. Lots of people in the live chat. Nick Marotta in the live chat. Did we mention Nick Marotta? Rob Inman. Uh, Terry Steen was in the live chat. Lots of people. I'm sure I'm missing a few now, but there's Coco so many. Zilla. Coco no, Zilla. No, no adult websites. No adult. Uh, no, we websites. had no sexy girl today. No adult. Uh, no adult sex, sex site dot com was here today. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, all right. Good. Good show, guys. We've just hit three hours. I think we've talked about a lot. And plenty more to talk about. James Jones says, fun show and thanks. So what we'll do now is we'll start our first round of closing credits. So if you haven't remembered what you wanted to talk about, you've got at least two more chances. So this is the beginning of the end, but it's not the end of the end. So stay tuned.
This is Coco Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. Streaming live on YouTube and Roku, available as a podcast and enjoyed the world over. And now, here's your... Oh, wait a second. That's the intro. I played the intro. What an idiot. (laughs) All right. Do it. Hey, now here's your host. Okay, I'm wondering because I was wondering why I didn't have the thing of us here. All right, let's try this again. Hey, we're, we got we got to start the whole show over now. Sorry, guys. Okay. <laughs> What's the topic? Drive this wire. concludes another episode of Coco there we Talk, go. the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. For all things Coco Talk, visit us on the web at cocotalk.live. We'd love to hear from you. Send feedback, suggestions, even segments via email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live. If you love the color computer like we do, then visit imacoconut.com for all your color computer links needs. Consider supporting the show with a purchase of merchandise from our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, visit the (laughs) Patreon link on our site at cocotalk.live. Coco Talk would not exist without the community and its cast and crew. Thanks go to Curtis Boyle, David Ladd, Mark Overholzer, Grant Leedy, Bruce Moore, Nick Morentes, Ron Vo, Rick Adams, Jason Riker, Richard Lorbieski, Jim Brain, Karen Anscombe, Simon Jonason, Wayne Campbell, Steve Batson, Brian Joyce, John Strong, and Barry Nelson. Special thanks to Steve Bjork for production suggestions and Brian Joyce for our best of episodes and bonus content. Please help support the Coco community by visiting some of its contributors. The Coco Crew podcast at cococrew.org. Glenside Color Computer Club, host of Coco Fest at glensideccc.com. Jim Brain and Retro Innovations at go, the number four, retro.com. Tandy Assembly at tandyassembly.com. Boyson Technologies at B-O-Y-S-O-N tech.com. Get your own switcheroo at cocoman.biz and Cloud9 Technologies at cloud, the number nine, tech.com. Coco Talk is hosted by Steve Strobridge, co-hosts, technical directors, segment hosts and producers, like Curtis Boyle, <laughs> David Ladd, Grant Steve Lee, Strobridge, Mark Overholzer, <laughs> Ron Delvo, and Jason Reichert. Production motivation, Steve Bjork. The Coco Talk theme song is copyright 2008 by D. Bruce Moore and Greg Shalar. Mix, mastered, and produced by D. Oh, Bruce losers. Moore. Coco forever, people. And let's not forget a very special thank you to Roger Taylor for getting us on the Coco TV channel on Roku. The three muggeteers there. The three losers. <laughs> yeah! We always miss the high note now because I'm doing a shorter version of the show. All right. Well, that was the credits, folks. Have we missed anything? Did we beat it to death? Anything else worth talking about? Have we mentioned Nick Morota? Uh, we have not mentioned Nick Morota. Nor um, have we mentioned Coco Talk After Dark. We have not mentioned Coco Talk After Dark. Uh, <laughs> Rob Inman saying, is this level two? <laughs> We've made it to level two. Yes, we have. And nobody's rage quit. So that's so, a good thing. So how, how can we get a hold of Nick Morota? Uh, Nick, Nick Morota. How does one get a hold of Nick Morota? Is there a nickmorota.com website? Just call 1-900-NICK-MORODA. 1-900-NICK-MORODA. It's like one eight hundred flowers, but this is the uh, chat line one one nine hundred Nick Morota. CNN. Uh, Nick Morota is so cool. I have all of his albums. <laughs> Just go to Nick Morota dot Nick Morota dot Nick Morota <laughs> slash Nick Morota. <laughs> Somebody needs to ping him. TRS eighty mic. It's then what is this? Show us your magazines now. So, yeah, he uh, was doing it. He was doing it. <laughs> Nick Morota. He's playing the Coco too, right? Oh, look everybody's at that. doing it. Oh, the Rainbow Fest and the Rainbow have to express our appreciation to Rick Adams. There we go. <laughs> Rob Inman says that Nick Morona is the front man for Journey these days. <laughs> is he short? Don't stop believing. <laughs> hey, the MC10 yeah. magazine. Yeah. Just think that girl now is legal. So, She's, yeah, for She's all of you, uh, <laughs> and they're all named different names. Might even be past her expiration date. Yeah, one of her kids is named MC10. The other one's called VDG. The other one's called ESP. So you got one kid named Drivewire. So. <laughs> and, and one's named Alice. Alice, yeah, for the other Coco, right? 
yeah. MC10. Yeah, the 100, Model 100. This is mm-hmm. beautiful. This is what's known as beating something to death that's already dead segment of the show, right? So <laughs> the longer we stay here, the more magazines somebody's going to hold up here. So, But yeah, had, I, did we mention Nick Morota? Do you guys remember? <laughs> Rainbow. Who? Give me more power for the Rainbow. Give me more power. All right, while you guys are flashing your magazines here, I'm going to run the uh, closing Check credits. That credits. That is an awesome office there, right? It's a Model yeah. 3 there. or that's Yeah. Yeah, that's a hard drive to the side and a printer. Yeah. Back when the computers were so big, they needed their own special furniture just to hold them up. <laughs> I can't hear you. We're printing out the yes. report. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back after these uh, more closing credits here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Antonio oh, Jimenez, of Test Project <laughs> the TV Throw Devil, and the SD Pack, and you are watching Coco Talk in 3, 2, two go. <laughs> I'm behind you making face. Okay. <laughs> you, you have a You're rolling, Curtis. You say whatever the hell you want to say. Well, give me some kind of guideline. Um, hi, this is Curtis Boyle. Hey, this is Eric, and you're listening to Coco Talk. All right, we're rolling. You say whatever you want to say, David. Nation, world, sweetie. Weekly, any computer. Something like that. All right, I'm soon playing dagger with like that idiot from the book. <laughs> You're watching Coco Talk. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, now get back up there for one second. Oh, jeez. Come on. What? What, what, what? Let's get some drive wire, TTL, no. ESP. No, we don't need any drive wire or TTL. <laughs> Hi, it's Chris Boyle, part of the uh, Coco Tech crew of people. Hi, we're on Delbo Timberman. I guess I'll to uh, experience Coco Fest. You must come. I mean, I brought the only working MC10. I could not get it. I could not get it. could not get it. Couldn't get a grant. Ah. By certain someone you know. The world's leading weekly Coco Talk Show. Yeah, something like that. Hi, this is Rick Adams, and I'm the author of uh, Temple of Brom, Shanghai, and now Bomb Threat, and you're listening to Stephen Stroke on Coco Talk. Eight slot MPI, you know, floppy drive, Coco SDC, um, sound speech pack, orchestra 90, RS232 pack, modem pack, uh, super IDE. You start adding all those together if you want them all usable at the same time well guess what you just went over the four slot mpi there we have it there and in in addition to not crossing the streams you don't want to go over the four slot mpi these are important rules so what do you have here adventures the rainbow book of adventures the there we fourth go. Event the book fourth of rainbow book of adventures and this is uh oh color Coco? computer Co- Coco. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm Welcome to Magazine Talk, the after show of Coco Talk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and Ken. I don't have any magazines. I have to just bring in all the manuals. Ken says that's the contest I lost. That was at the fourth <laughs> round. <laughs> he said, "Was that you his know, spy game?" Truth to that. Yeah. <laughs> There's something you don't see every day. What's that? Oh, the uh, the modem on the phone on top of the thing, like a teletype, huh? Yeah. Wow. Thanks. Now we're going back to VCF West now. My, my first modem was an acoustic modem. Yeah. It was not Spy, Ken. I wonder which one it was. Um, cool. Good show, guys. So, there, so Ron, you had asked a question about an after dark. Um, and I don't know. Every time we say, well, maybe we'll have an after dark. And then I check Discord in the evening. And sometimes it's a ghost town. But uh, it doesn't get dark where you live? Uh, yeah, No, it doesn't. No, I'm in Alaska. So six you know, months out of the air, it's... It, it just Usually, what happens is Stevie has a really big meal, and yeah. then he just goes into a food coma for the rest of the evening. And that does happen, yes. But yeah. you know the uh, the um, the Zoom the Zoom thing is open all weekend, and Grant can stream too. So if Grant gets home from work and he wants to do an after dark, we have that luxury now. Uh, but yeah, so let's just say if you guys are interested, let's let's ping each other in Discord in a couple hours, and maybe we'll do an after dark. Or a oh, retro talk cool. or something. I've got a beer in the refrigerator, so it's 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 uh, uh, it's ready. Oh, by the way, Rick Adams, happy birthday! Rick Adams just celebrated his birthday Yay. recently. Everybody, thank you. 
Thank Whatever you, thank cake. you. You're too kind. He's now officially surpassed the age of dirt. <laughs> Look, a, a printer enclosure because it was so loud. Oh, this printer noise dampener. Remember that? That was something, yeah. yeah. I had a customer that had one of those. Holy that crap. Amazing? That Shout is. Got a huge, uh, what did they call them back then? Not a band printer. Daisy Wheel 2s. Yeah, that is something. You know, Stevie, it just here's, here's our future. It, it just occurred to me that, and I should have said this during the Dennis interview, luckily you never got a Model 1 TR-80 because you never would have got off of level 1. Oh, wow. Wow. That's me. Ouch. That, that is the most hilarious dad joke I have ever heard. <laughs> Burn. Uh, uh, Curtis is saying we had uh, Printronics 300s with those dampeners. They That's were right. hammer bank based and printed at 300 lines per minute. Oh, uh, you, wow. you guys never got to mess with Qum Daisy Wheel printers because they uh, tended to you know catch on fire. Oh, wow. The heat and friction against the paper, huh? Yeah, that was actually that was actually Tandy's first uh, Daisy Wheel printer. That, that sounds more like a thermal printer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So the question says the question has come up: Is Sexy Girl going to be on After Dark tonight? We'll have to wait and see. Um, we did get a request for strippers to join the show, so if we get a few more Patreons to kick in, we might be able to afford uh, you know an Grant, exotic an yeah, exotic Grant, dancer. Grant might might uh you know cross dress yeah grant will cross he, he, he needs, he needs to practice. I, can, I can get some paint stripper <laughs> i think i have some acetone here somewhere yeah uh, grant needs to practice all right we're going to officially beat this one to death and we're going to pull the plug on it uh time of death is now 5 20 uh p.m eastern standard time three hours and 15 minutes into the train wreck we're gonna say good night gracie good night Good night, Gracie. Gracie. All right. We'll possibly see you guys on an after dark with strippers or hookers or something. All right, guys. Take care. Okay. Bye. <laughs> yeah.